Alrighty, chat. Does this work? Okay. All right. So we tried. We're we're playing around with a couple things, but we're we're good to go now. So, um, welcome to another Healthy Gamer GG stream. My name is Alok Kanoja. Just a reminder that although I'm a psychiatrist, nothing we discuss on stream today is intended to be taken as medical advice. Everything is for educational or entertainment purposes only. If y'all have a concern or question, please go see a licensed professional. So it's super excited today. We are actually going to hop um, into a stream with Dr. Michaela Thordarson, who uh, is an awesome psycho. I believe she's a psychologist, but we'll we'll learn a little bit more about her. She's been, I think, a stream guest of ours before, but she's going to be talking about, or we're going to be talking about women's mental health. Um, and so we'll hop into that in, in just a minute. But before we hop into that, we've got a couple of announcements. Um, I'm going to be out for some amount of time in February, uh, and we are building out new stuff. So we're focusing a little bit on content for parenting. And so we're going to be building some of that stout stuff out in February. So stay tuned. Um, so our stream schedule may be a little bit all over the place in Feb. And then the last thing is that we just finished a super secret project, which is one of the reasons that we have been out previously. And this is what our super secret project is. So um, we have it coming out soon. So we're, we're done filming. We are now in post. And uh, yeah, so we know that y'all love some of the stuff that we do. So we're trying to do the best that we can for y'all. Um, but since we're already running a little bit late, let's actually just hop right in with Dr. Thornarson. Okay. Let me do this. Hello. 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 Okay. Can you see me? I can. Yes. Okay. And hear me? Yes. And we are, okay. So we are good to go. So, um, awesome. welcome once again to the internet. We miss you. We love you. Um, do you want to just take a second to tell us a little bit about who you are and where you come from? Sure. Um, thanks so have so thanks oh, words. Thanks so much for having me back. Um, so great to be here. Um, I'm Dr. Michaela Thorderson. I go by Michaela or Dr. Michaela if you're feeling particularly interested in remaining formal. Um, I am um, a clinical child psychologist by training. Um, in specialty area, but have really done a lot of my work through my career across the lifespan and across a, a couple different settings um, for people who are just a little bit experiencing mental health conditions all the way to people who are experiencing some pretty severe symptoms. So I think that's like a brief introduction. Yeah, awesome. And so what does your day job look like right now? Doctor, uh, what do you want me to yeah. call you? Do you want me to call you Dr. Thorderson or? Michaela's good. Okay. No, Michaela's good. Yeah, thank you. Um, my day job currently, I work with the Children's Hospital in Southern California, and I run a couple programs that are exclusively for um, suicidal youth. Okay. So one of those programs is an intensive out pro outpatient program, which is something where kids and their families come to for about 13 to 15 hours a week. And then one of those programs is a short term, brief, structured intervention to provide safety for kids who are experiencing suicidal thoughts while they're getting connected to services. Um, to get that long-term care. Awesome. Cool. And so today we're going to be talking about women's mental health, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what, what have you seen, like what's going on with women's mental health? <laughs> um, uh, that's such a fun question. Um, I think that uh, I don't really know when we started to pay a little bit more attention to the fact that like women and men might be a little bit different. Um, and then noticing that a lot of our foundational research in mental health um, had was very male heavy, was very white heavy, was very like middle socioeconomic heavy. And so uh, we built a lot of stuff on premises, um, exclusively focused around a, a more narrow group of folks, not necessarily recognizing how different we all are as human beings. And so I don't know if it was like 20 years ago or when it started where we started thinking, hmm, we should actually start to think about how applicable this is across like different groups of folks. Um, and so one of those groups obviously is, you know, women. Um, and then I think just kind of diving into the fact that women are different, not just for, from our biology. And there are some obviously really clear differences in our biology but also um, a little bit in our brains and the ways that our brains function between like um, women and men. 
uh, but also the way that society treats um, women and the way that that affects uh, things in really big ways and that we uh, we kind of, in some ways, have a hard time pulling apart the differences between what is a biological contribution and what is a social contribution because social contributions kind of start in, in the womb. So, um, yeah, I think that, I think we're really starting to dive into what are those differences and how do we understand them and what do they mean um, as like a global perspective. Um, and it really just does affect so many different things. Um, I think a thing that has been, well, I'll pause there, but um, I don't know, what are you, you kind of thinking and seeing in the areas of like women's mental health? Um. Yeah, so th that's an awesome uh, explanation. I have so many questions for you, but I'm I'm happy to answer. So, so I I, th I think, like you said, I I think there's some fundamentals, in just to give you an example. So there's some fundamentals in our models of disease that are very um, male centric. So the simplest example is I was looking at um, research on. So I've had uh, several uh, female patients who have like diagnoses like ADHD. And we sort of, so if you look at like even the diagnostic criteria of ADHD, it's like fixed over time. That's the whole point is that you have mm -hmm. these kinds of impairments and that we sort of view ADHD as like relatively constant. Whereas there's mm -hmm. actually a ton of emerging research that the symptoms of ADHD will fluctuate depending on your menstrual cycle. So if we sort of think about like this is such a deep, deep, deep foundational thing is that once you have a disease, the disease is the disease. Not that it fluctuates and it's different two weeks out of the month versus two weeks out of the month. So even the fact that you have one biological organism, which is like a man, which does not appear to have hormonal fluctuations, which affect everything from pain sensitivity to cognitive function to sleep to appetite. There's so many different things that are hormonally affected. And so th this yeah. sort of means that like, you know, I've even had patients that we've realized like, so like patients will come in and we'll start them on a stimulant medication or something like that. And then some weeks it seems to really help. And then some, some weeks they come in and they say like, oh, like we've already know what the answer is now, but this is really confusing, right? Cause they don't teach you this in med school. So they come in and they're like, right. yeah, the medication works fantastic. Oh my God. And then they come in two weeks later and they're like the medication, like I'm having all these side effects and this is going on. Then let's stop it. And then two weeks later, they're like the medication, I, I, it, I'm a mess. I need the medication again. Okay, let's start it. And then like, it's really confusing. And then you sort of realize, oh, actually, so the, the pathophysiology of the disease process is fluctuating on a week to week basis. And it's even gotten to the point where sometimes I will prescribe stimulants, like depending on where people are. So a third, you know, you don't take the stimulant every day, like around this particular time, we're going to take the stimulant around this time, you may not need it. And so there's all kinds of fluctuations, which don't get considered. Yeah. Um, so, so that's just like one example of something I'm seeing, but th there's also stuff like on what I would call kind of like cognitive load. Um, so I, I think yeah. that there's a lot of, while there's, I think generally speaking, we're trending towards equality in a lot of ways. I think that, mm -hmm. um, women struggle with a lot of like cognitive load in relationships. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. even if, if, uh, I mean, I, I certainly saw this in, in my relationship where like when we started to have kids, like the default, like who was mentally responsible for stuff? Like even if our workload was 50, mm 50, -hmm. who was mentally mm -hmm. responsible for stuff is usually my wife. And that's changed mm -hmm. now. But, uh, so it's, it's kind of interesting because people will sometimes perceive an equal amount of like physical labor being done. But I think that people don't really acknowledge, we don't really acknowledge as a society that if no one takes care of something, it's usually the a woman in the family unit that is ultimately responsible for a particular thing. Now, there, yeah. there are particular situations where you can argue against that. You can say things like financial security is something that is primarily like the, the, the male in the relationship has the cognitive load for that. And there's definitely some evidence of that. But I think there's just a lot of stuff that we sort of take for granted which is which I'm seeing affect women more and more and more, especially as we move to dual income households, to professional mm -hmm. careers. And then when you think about like, you know, having kids or something like that, the work is almost never like 50 50. Um, mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of I, I don't know what you're looking for, but like I've seen stuff that's a little bit yeah, more societally, yeah. like cognitively, like this is not like a mental illness thing. And then I've absolutely right. see, see, seen things that are diagnostic. Um, 
and and I also think that we there's certain fundamentals of our diagnosis diagnoses which are also biased against men as well. So I think we you know as you're kind of saying over the last 20 or 30 years we've realized that we cannot apply one system to like everyone equally. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, so if you've got a response to that you can go otherwise I've got questions for you. Uh I mean the 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 cognitive load I think is is such a fascinating concept, right? Because it is that invisible hidden work that typically women are doing um and that there are even like the first layer of things that a lot of, you know, traditionally men try to do to like help actually end up adding, you know, like, Hey, I want to, I want to cook dinner tonight. Or I want to, what do you want? Oh, I'm going to just order food. What do the kids prefer? You know, and, and it's often the moms who are thinking like, Oh, well, you know, that one won't eat it if the pepperoni touches the cheese or, <laughs> Yeah, you know things, things like that. So, um, and then there's also the emotional labor too of like thinking not just like oh I here's what I know about preferences, but also I'm implicitly the one who's responsible for the nurturing, for the making sure people are okay. That I have to check in. Somebody had a hard day, um, and the ways that we do that in our, in our. I mean, we talk about a lot like in a family unit with partners and kids, but also that often female children are, are more expected to check in on their parents. Hey, you know, my parents are not having a good time. Female people are traditionally checking in on their friends more often. And so that is something I'm, people are thinking about, but it's also, you know, oh, I also expect, I'm expected, whether people are saying with their words, I'm expected to do these things. I'm expected to be mm. available to hold it together so that I can kind of do those things. So c can I ask for like um, a little bit more detail around, so like you, you mentioned this phrase of hidden work. Um, so can you mm -hmm. tell us like what that means and sort of explain the concept and maybe like offer an example or two of what that could look like or what you've seen as a clinician? Yeah, I mean, just coming off of the holiday season, you know, that everybody celebrates really differently, but that they're... Um, oftentimes across celebration styles and groups of folks, it is often the women who are doing the things like, oh, um, what am I thinking? How am I gonna make my space beautiful? How am I gonna make it look festive? How am I going to, uh, who needs presents and who doesn't need presents? And what do they like and what do they already have? And so these are all things that are in your mind that are not being kind of even necessarily even talked about but there's a lot of work being done, whether that's just thinking or whether that's hopping on Amazon and, you know, window shopping or running through a list of things or looking up activities to plan or, hey, my work group, um, we'd really like to celebrate the holidays together. So what's that going to look like? And so then there's the, sure, somebody sends out an invitation or a text message and it doesn't even have to be formal. But what went behind that text message was thinking things like, well, we're all really busy on Monday and Tuesday and, you know, Wednesday is probably the best day because people have family commitments over the weekend. And then I'm going to look up a restaurant that we can all go out to, but it's not too expensive, but it's going to have gluten-free options because, you know, um, Sarah, she doesn't eat gluten. But all that looks like has been done is somebody picked a place and sent out a text message to invite the group on a day. And so that, that hidden work that goes into sometimes a ton of different activities. I think that when these kinds of things started coming up on my socials and I was like, oh, mental load, oh, cognitive load, and then looking into that in different ways, you start to pay attention to all the things that you're doing that are, you know, hidden hidden pieces. A different example, um, on some of the team, one of the teams that I run, there was one person who was kind of doing all of the planning and prepping and photocopies and making sure that different supplies were ready. And then they were in this like on and off very quick cycle of burnout. So they would be okay and then be falling apart. And the rest of the team is like, what's going on with you? And it was good. So now we created what we, I mean, we call it a quarterback sheet, but we created a piece of paper that basically just explicitly identifies all the different pieces that need to go into a day of work. And now people have to sign up for each individual task. So it, it's not inadvertently falling to one person um, who's doing all the work and then also not being recognized for it. Mm. 
because that's the kind of piece of that hidden labor is that nobody even knows you're working that hard. So it's a literally thankless job. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. I, I like the idea of this quarterback sheet. And so, so it sounds like there's a lot of hidden work that is that is planning in nature or cognitive in nature. But you also mentioned that a lot of the emotional labor oftentimes falls to women. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So thinking about, um, uh, let me see, like um, thinking about friend groups, right? So um, friend groups. Uh, maybe traditionally are single gender, but now are being a little bit more kind of like diversified um, on average. And so a lot of times it falls to like, if somebody is having a hard day or a hard week or is going through a rough time, um, a lot of times within a friend group, it's the women or the females who are expected to be the ones who are more responsive. Or um, if somebody kind of like has a conflict or, you know, somebody's like, um, I'm always dramatic and I'm like, oh, unleashes the theory. But, you know, so <laughs> somebody's like kind of snaps at people, right? If it's um, a person who like is more male, we are like, oh, you know, we write it off, we let it go. There's not an emotional uh, component to the, that person often saying like, oh, now I need to apologize. I need to make sure nobody's feelings were hurt versus um, traditionally women will be like, oh, I now need to think about the group. I, I need to not just like, I'm having a hard time. I need to talk about it, but I need to make sure everybody else is okay. I need to make sure that I haven't, you know, disrupted our, you know, friend ecosystem. Mm. I'm the one who needs to go check in with everybody else and see how they're doing. And a lot of times in friend groups or, you know, groups of humans, like women will hide their own emotions because they want to take care of everybody first. And that's both, there is some biological contribution to that, but it is heavily socialized um, that women are expected to be the nurturers, the emotional um, caregivers. Yeah. So where does that sense of responsibility come from? Like, how how does that happen? <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, it's, it's when I first started looking into the research around this, I was like, kind of like mind blown because there's research that says that from the moment that um, a woman finds out the sex of her baby, the people around her start treating the baby differently. This is before the baby has exited the mother's body. The people are talking about the baby, about if, if the sex is female, um, oh, I'm sure she's going to be beautiful. She's going to be so nice. She's going to be lovely. And boys are typically talked about as like, strong and smart and you know that they're gonna accomplish things and then thinking about that language continues obviously after the babies come out of um the womb but then thinking about like what toys do we give very tiny children and boys get cars traditionally right cars action figures um you know, superheroes, things like that, eventually like guns and swords and, you know, fighting and battle stuff. And girls get, you know, girls get dolls and they play dress up and then they get shopping carts and cute little kitchens. Um, and sometimes there's a little bit more variability when kids are littler, but once they start getting to they're hanging out with other kids. So like kindergarten or when other kids are going to come into the home. And I literally was just talking to a parent a couple of days ago who was who's saying that they let their kids play with any toys they want. But once he got to like eight or nine, they really were like, oh, we should take the dollhouse out of your room. I want to help you because if your friends come over and see you have a dollhouse, that might not go so well for you. And so even in families that are like accepting and we're not going to force kids to have certain toys, eventually the message is, hey, because you are a boy, you're not allowed to have a dollhouse. Because you're a boy, we got to take the kitchen stuff out of your room. Um, and so it's really interesting the way that, and if that's the way that we're talking about kids and their activities and their interests when they're really little, it would be like kind of silly to think that, oh, that just changes, you know, one day. Yeah. Um, so that that caregiving, right? That home's focused, that babies, um, it starts so early. That's so interesting. 
And and you mentioned that even uh, girls are more sort of emotionally responsible for parent par parental well being. So can you talk a little bit about like parentification of children or or and like what that sort of looks like and how that affects women specifically? Yeah, um, and I'm a little bit less fluent on like the research around these pieces. So I have kind of like just a, a superficial level of, of the research understanding, especially because this can vary heavily by culture. Um, so like um, country, um, you know, and then the way that gender roles are kind of normed and then the ways that those genders are are and are not allowed to be outside of the home. So this, this can vary kind of more widely, um, but oftentimes women, but especially eldest females, right, are put in the roles of like mini parents. And so initially that is helping with any younger kids. Um, it's also helping with tasks around the house. So the you are, as the oldest female, you are the sous chef. Right, so you're going to help cutting, chopping things up. You're going to help with dishes, um, or any other thing. So I, I am an eldest daughter, and I, as an adult, loathe wrapping gifts, like loathe it, because as soon as I knew that Santa was um, clearly visiting my household, um, I was responsible for wrapping all of the presents. Um, and so that was just my default uh, task, even after other siblings um, kind of made different, you know, awarenesses around Santa. Um, I was still the one who was responsible for wrapping all the gifts. And um, there are there's actually a little bit of um, research around this, but there's a lot of stuff on my socials that's <laughs> about how like a lot of oldest girls don't want kids or delay having children if they do want children because it's either like well I need to make sure everyone else is okay first is one hypothesis or there's just some fatigue like I've had kids since I was five so <laughs> I'm not sure I want more kind of a situation and then as your parents kind of enter a different phase of life now, instead of having children, you have parents mm. that you're responsible for checking in and scheduling doctor's appointments and taking them shopping or, you know, teaching them how to use technology so that they can stay connected because boys would be more traditional. Like, do they have the money? Can I send them groceries? But girls are going to be like, oh, but they're lonely. Um, you know, I need to help them feel not sad and kind of thinking about those pieces. Yeah, that's that's so fascinating. So just a couple of things. And by the way, uh, Michaela, thank you so much for sharing all this. This is this is, I think, exactly what we are looking for. Um, so just a couple of thoughts. One is, you know, it's interesting because you talked about being the eldest girl and sort of needing to wrap presents. So in my culture. There is also a age difference and a gender difference. Gender roles are very, very segregated traditionally in Indian culture. And so since my I didn't I don't have any sisters. So I became oh. so so the youngest brother becomes fills the role of because like the, the eldest brother is like the patriarch. Right. So in the same way that the eldest daughter becomes sort of parentified and becomes the mini parent. So the, mm -hmm. the eldest brother becomes somewhat of the mini parent um, in, in Indian households, but they also get sort of turned into golden boys. Uh, <laughs> and then so as the younger brother, I sort of fill in the female role. So like I okay. fulfill the daughter's role. So whenever like my mom needed help in the kitchen, like my brother got to do whatever he wanted to do. But like I was sort of the sous chef. So it's, it's something yeah. that I resonate with a lot. Um, the yeah. other, the other really interesting thing is I'm, I'm reminded of so many of the, the women I've, I've worked with in terms of uh, patients of mine. And the other really interesting thing is I've noticed now that I'm thinking, I never thought about this before that I had a group of, I've had a group of women who are always the punching bags in their family. These are usually older women. Mm. So they're the punching bags of their siblings. They're the mm -hmm. punching bags of their kids. They're the punching bags of their parents. So like, mm. you know, if like, you know, let's say they have, there's a brother, there, there's like a, a 35 year old with, who struggles with addiction and their 51 year old sister is somehow like the place that everyone goes to. 
So parents like lean on them because like parents can't handle it at this point or their mm -hmm. other siblings or like other like cousins show up and they'll be like, you know, kid has an addiction. Your mom and dad are like too, like they're too gullible. Like they don't set limits. Like, so then who do they turn to? They, they turn to this particular person. And then so they sort of almost become the default punching bag. And I never connected now that I'm thinking about it. They are actually all the oldest daughter mm -hmm. in, in the relationship or in, in the family unit. So like mm -hmm. in even parents will kind of I mean, their their own kids will kind of get mad at them, too. There's sure. some kind of like and I think that's what what kids will pick up on is they'll see the the family dynamics. Right. So like who yeah. who is OK to blame when I'm right. having problems? This is the way we all treat that person. Yes. And then especially if it's been happening for that person's like whole life. Right. They also, this is how I am. This treated. is my job. This yeah. is my, yes, exactly. So, so just a huge part of the therapy is like, let people fucking make their own mistakes. Yes. Right. Cause when you try to stop them, they yep. hate you for it. Yep. So it's a lose, lose situation. Yep. If you try to stop them and they don't listen and things go wrong anyway, they still un end up blaming you because if you hadn't interfered, yep. everything would have been fine. I'll see this, especially when, when we have, mothers who have daughters or sons who are in unhealthy romantic relationships so this mm -hmm. in-law situation right so the mother-in-law mm -hmm. is like always the bad thing and speaking of like yes. societal conditioning I, I think it's kind of shocking like even my kids started to worry a little bit about like when they started to understand that like parents aren't permanent and that sometimes things like divorce happen they were terrified of their hypothetical mother-in-law because the mother-in-law is always the villain oh, the stepmother Yes. Oh, sorry. The sorry. Yes. Stepmother. Sorry. That was a Absolutely. Freudian slip. So in, in my culture, it's the mother-in-law who's always the villain, but it's the stepmother. Yes. You know, th they're viewed as, is very evil and conniving. And I was just kind of thinking as I read story after story after story to my kids, oh my God, what are we step, what, how are we setting up stepmoms for failure? You yes. know, like before they even enter the picture, there's a whole conditioning around stepmothers being evil. Yes. But it's, it's so interesting to think about some of my patients and just how they kind of like fall into this, this scenario of like, um, <laughs> there's one patient that I'm thinking about who, uh, uh, you know, patient comes in, into my office and they're like, I'm frustrated. You know, I, I'm in this, I'm, things are stressful at home. I said, well, what's, what happened? And they said, well, so, you know, my, my son is registering for college classes and they're, they're 21 years old. And so a couple days before I said, hey, are you, did you register yet? Are you going to register? And mom is nagging them, right? And so, so kid says, I'm an adult. Stop treating me like a child. And they're like, did you set your alarm? You're going to have to register for your classes. They get a frantic phone call three days later, Friday at 1 mm -hmm. p.m. I didn't get any of the classes that I wanted. I'm stuck with these fucking freshman times, 8 a.m. classes. Why didn't yeah. you call me? <laughs> Why didn't you wake yeah. me up? Uh-huh. And and yeah. so th this is so interesting to kind of hear you talk about because I've seen it so much. I never put the pieces of the puzzle together because someone comes in and we're like, okay, let's understand how to set boundaries. Right. Um, right. Yes. And so we'll we'll sort of work on that and, and people get better. But I, I never sort of connected this pattern together. Uh, so so it's, it's cool. It's really interesting to see things get connected. I mean, I, I enjoy seeing that. I'll be able to. Yeah. I'm going to reach out to a couple of my patients and be like, hey, I didn't ever realize this, but. You know, I was wondering, did you ever think about being the eldest daughter and what role that's played for you? But that's so cool. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, yeah. Did you have something else you wanted to add or something you wanted to build on or? I mean, I think I'm kind of hearing you talk about like, oh, wow, these kind of like missing pieces that we're kind of connecting the dots on. Um, and I know we were kind of thinking about talking and you mentioned ADHD before, but there's also like how many things that we have um, been able to socialize women into to hide some of the mental health conditions or like developmental differences that people are born with. And it's kind of this message of like, you're fine, just toe the line. As long as you can get there, you don't need help, you don't need support. And so because social influences can be so powerful, how women kind of then get maybe missed or neglected in some of the things where we, especially developmentally, could use a lot more support, but also things like depression and anxiety. Like 
you know, you're supposed to be a perfectionist as a woman. So like, that's not anxiety, that's adaptive or, oh, you have a period. So of course you're moody sometimes, like it's the hormones rather than recognizing that either it's maybe a true depression or that our hormones have some powerful effects on our bodies and brains. And that sometimes that's more than what is actually expected normatively. And that there may be something kind of going on there that that person needs more support around. So I think that like just this topic, like so many different like pieces kind of like pop up um, when we're thinking about it. Can I ask you a couple of specifics about that? Yeah. Okay. So can we talk about neurodivergence and, and yes. like autism spectrum or ADHD in girls, women? So you mentioned that, you know, there's a lot of towing the line. There's a lot of, uh, you know, masking that goes on if you want to explain what that means. So, so can you can you just tell yeah. us a little bit more about how we treat or address girls who are neurodivergent? Yeah, so thinking <clears throat> and specifically starting with like the autism spectrum disorders um, and that um, pretty much the biggest brain difference across people who have autism or don't have autism is that kind of like social orientation. And so people with autism often have difficulties or differences in their ability to either perceive social cues and put them together in the same way that we can, or that some like social elements may be more overwhelming, right? So like eye contact, for example, like eye contact, like pretty intimate, pretty personal in couples therapy. There's a whole thing where you're supposed to like stare into each other's eyes for like three minutes uninterrupted to like really connect or something, which is like, <laughs> holy cow. All that to illustrate that <clears throat> eye contact is very intimate and very intense. So if you're a person whose brain naturally is a little bit overwhelmed by that intimate connection, and you're avoiding eye contact, um, but for women, you're expected to be social. You need to do the things as a woman that you know you're oriented, you're connecting, and so we um, correct non-social behaviors a lot faster in girls and a lot more intensely hmm. and so girls learn that okay i have to do these things because my environment is kind of saying like you're unacceptable the way you are and so they they kind of get this really intense influence from the outside that they need to act a certain way that doesn't mean that it is all of a sudden gone that oh now social things make sense to me or now mm. i'm totally comfortable with like hugs or making eye contact or having like close connection or close physical proximity it just means i don't know what i'm supposed to do with this except act like i'm okay with it um and so the the actual support in either learning some of those things or having different kinds of relationships never happen because that's just it's it's a hidden diagnosis. And um, as I was kind of talking about the research earlier, when we first did research on, on the autism spectrum disorder, we were not looking at differences between boys and girls, and boys were being diagnosed at significantly higher rates than girls were. So obviously, boys are more likely to have autism. Well, when we started actually looking at girls with autism and thinking about like, oh, hey, you know what? There may be differences here that we are correcting and changing and when you look at that, the diagnostic rates have gotten closer and closer over mm. time. Um, so that's, you know, just like, oh, it's not that there's there's a like, oh, boys have more autism. It's that we're not as good at finding girls with autism. Oh, interesting. And then it's the same. Yeah. So it's it's very, um, yeah, very fascinating. And then I've, I've recently dived into the world of like um, on some of my social, some like lived experience accounts. So those are accounts that are um, either hosted by people with conditions or are kind of designed to be a place for people with these different mental health conditions to talk about their experiences and their conditions. So not research-based, not evidence-based treatment, like those things that like you and I are really socialized to be focused on um, and have been really, really intrigued at the power of like, self-diagnosis or that like um sometimes what we think of as the, the evidence-based like first-line approaches so for autism that's aba or applied behavioral analysis um might 
not fit for everybody or might not take into account the perspective of the person who's going through that thing. So for example, like the, the eye contact in ABA, you train kids with autism to make eye contact. And so I've kind of been hearing from like these communities that like, that's not helpful to me. Like, why would you make me essentially, they were giving like a, a metaphor of like staring at a painfully bright light. Why would you force me to do that? Why wouldn't you dim the light? Why wouldn't you say, who needs to look at lights? You're still in the room. And so I think those are some other perspectives of like, oh, our treatments are kind of bringing people who have fundamental differences and saying, no, you have to fit into the way this society currently is. Um, and that women are often the ones who are impacted more by that. And so then, you know, you grow up as an, and you get to adulthood not understanding some real big pieces about yourself and then you get to adulthood and you're like holy shit this makes so much sense i have had this difference there's nothing wrong with me i'm just different but no one ever acknowledged it no one ever gave me space to be myself um i've just been acting like a different person for so long um and then you could imagine like the depression and anxiety that comes with that. And at some point it's like, do you have a mental health condition or are you just having a natural reaction to being like low key rejected your whole life? Um, so really interesting pieces around like the gender differences. Yeah, that's fascinating. So so I, I think it's so interesting how one of the things that I've seen, especially with neurodivergence um, and and one of the things that's really shocked me is how neuro how for granted neurotypical parents i don't even know how to say this so when you're a neurotypical parent with a neurodivergent kid and you instruct your child it's amazing how how for granted we take that our child can put the pieces of the puzzle together so like like I, mm. i'm even thinking about my own kids one of whom may be on the neurodivergent spectrum somewhat and then so it's so interesting because for one of my kids i can just tell them Like, hey, mm -hmm. like, if you do this, like, people will be upset with you. And mm -hmm. and she's able to piece together the puzzles and she understands it right away. But, like, for one of my kids, I had to sit down and explain to her, like, this is what how friendship works. Like, yes. she, she did not have an instinctive understanding of why, like, how friends work. And then, yes. and then, like, I, I sat down with her. We had a 45-minute conversation. I could see the light bulbs going off in her head. And and just really trying to explain to her, I was like, okay, like, who is your friend and who is not your friend? Why is this person your friend? Why is this person not your friend? Where She's like, I don't like this person because they do this. And I like this person because they do this. And I was like, okay, which one do you do? Well, and she's like, well, sometimes I'm I'm like these people who I don't like. And I was like, And so what do you think that that means? She means that, oh, so people won't want to be my friend. Oh, and then she kind of like gets it, right? And yeah. it's 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 amazing just how for granted we take when we we tell someone, you know, like, for example, when you mentioned the eye contact, you just tell someone, just look at someone. We don't really understand right. what that experience is doing, right? So we'll sort of push yeah. for a corrective behavior, which may have some argument. I know that ABA is about, you know, allowing neurodivergent people to function in a neurotypical world. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. And and at the same time, I've also seen cases, you know, I had a patient, I don't know if you're familiar with a condition called misophonia. Um, mm -hmm. But, but, me, you know, so, oh, yeah. <laughs> so you know, that was highly contentious at first, right? Like that's not a real thing. Oh, really? And now it turns out like, oh, oops, yeah, that is. Can you talk about thing. that? Um. I, it was so in our like diagnostic um, manuals, right? Like misophonia, there's there's like the the main chapters that it, that are right. Can, established can you start diagnosis. with what misophonia is? Oh, misophonia. Um, so it is, and I don't have like the perfect language for this, but it is like a condition, and that may actually be identifiable through neuro uh, like brain imaging studies. I'm not a hundred percent sure on that, but um, where, and at first it was like, oh, it's all sounds. And then it was like, well, that's not true. And then it was like some sounds, but specific ones. And now it turns out that different people have different kinds of sounds that are 
essentially like excruciating for them to experience. Um, and so, you know, naturally when we have trouble with something, the treatment is exposure. Just keep doing the thing until it no longer bothers you. Um, and uh, for misophonia, most people with misophonia, my understanding is have a really hard time doing that because we're putting them in, in a physiologically excruciating situation that honestly, like, how often do you sit next to somebody who's eating potato chips or chewing ice? Like, not that often. So do we really need to torture people so that they like hear real loud, awful sounds until they're like kind of okay with it? Like probably not. Um, but in the like, you know, research field, because this is something that is really hard to study because a lot of it initially was like a very subjectively described experience. Um, it was just like, well, obviously that's not a real thing. And so you've had this like group of people who have been going through life like seriously suffering at times. Um, like I know I um, know a couple people who I've worked with who um, will not go out to eat um, except at restaurants that like only serve salads or, you know, that have soft foods so that they're not in a restaurant where other people may be doing things. And eating is like just a, a common place where just a lot of different noises are coming around. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very interesting yeah. condition. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, so my understanding of it is that, so if you kind of like look at, you know, we get these auditory signals that enter our ear and then travel to this part of our brain and then our brain interprets an auditory signal in a particular way. And with misophonia, something about not the sound itself, but the way that our brain interprets right. the sound is incredibly painful or uncomfortable. It, it's kind of, yeah. um, you know, I, I one time, uh, the, the best way I can sort of describe it is is kind of like nails on a chalkboard, right? Like yes. the sensation that we get when there's like nails on a chalkboard is like what people with misophonia get when they're, you know, people are chewing. And yeah. and so, and, and for a long time, I, I, I have seen patients that went through exposure therapy because that was the treatment. And my take on it yes. is that they've just been like traumatized from that therapy. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and really it's, it's strange. Like the more I kind of dig into it, the more, like if you take a step back and really look at, okay, so what happened over time as you engaged in this therapy is they just got more and more and more traumatized from these repeated exposures. And then everyone is right. kind of telling them like, Hey, you've got to be strong, you know, like you can do it and like, keep doing it. Yeah. And and so then there was also this, it'll get better. Yeah. And, and then there's this personal association of failure. If you don't get better, right. We got to try harder oh, yeah. and we got to up it. And so the, the more it hurts, they're like, Oh, is this hot? Let's turn up the heat. Let's, yeah. you know, and it, it's, it's, it's crazy. Like, um, and anyway, so I, I've seen a couple patients like that and it really makes me wonder about, I also wonder if there's something related to neurodivergence, because if you look at things like RFID or, you know, the, the sensory, yeah. um, in, yeah. on the autism spectrum. Textures of food. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you're kind of saying that, uh, when it comes to women specifically, first of all, that, uh, girls are oftentimes we, can you talk a little bit more about like masking and sort of societal pressures mm. and how we take neurodivergent girls and what we do to them and, and sort of how that affects them? Yeah. So um, because our gender expectations are for women to be social and emotionally attuned and um, kind of like aware of other people, um, girls are getting messages almost, I mean, not even almost, like immediately that they need to be playing with other kids, right? It's okay for a boy to not necessarily go play sports, he can go climb a tree and nobody's gonna be like, what's wrong with that boy? Why is he climbing a tree? Why is he all alone? Um, it's okay for a boy to be really excited about rocks and bugs. Like that's sure, boys like rocks, they throw them. Um, you know, <laughs> boys like bugs, like they're cool. <laughs> um, but if a girl is off by herself, it's like, whoa, all the girls are sitting in a circle playing or all the girls are doing something together. Like that girl is a problem. We need her to go have friends, be with the other people. And then we, most people don't do what you do, Dr. K and say like, Hey, wait a second. Like 
this is why friendship's important. This is what's going to help be helpful for you. This, like, let me break this down for you so you can understand it in the way that your brain needs to be able to understand it. And instead they're like, don't do that. You need to play with the other girl. And it's not often like angry or punitive. It's just like, oh, let me help you. You need to go do these things. Um, one of the things that we look at in kids on the autism spectrum disorder is something called parallel play. So when you put kids with other kids at a certain age, they play together. Well, kids on the spectrum uh, will play next to each other. So they're not in any way playing together. Um, it's like if I was playing Call of Duty sitting next to you playing Halo, we're not on the same game, but we're just like having a good time being near each other. Um, and so we typically l allow boys to do that for a longer period of time and then notice like, oh, wow, that that's unusual. We need to do something about it versus girls who engage in parallel play get pretty immediate corrective messages that they need to be playing together, that they need to be doing it together. So for those girls that are neurodivergent, they're like, uh, oh, I guess I'm going to do this thing, but I don't understand it. And I don't actually even really like it, but everybody else seems to understand it around me. And then as those girls grow, then they start to feel very anxious about being around other kids. And so they either do the, like, I'm just going to have one or two friends, or I'm going to keep masking, but always feel like everyone understands this in a way that I don't. People seem to be getting this in a way that doesn't make sense to me but they don't know how to ask. And I mean, think about, you've done this with sounds like one of your kids. When somebody actually asks you a question, like how do you make friends? Or how do you um, have a romance? Like, how do, you, how do I get a girlfriend? It's like, uh, I, yeah, that's actually a lot more complicated. Like if you try to break down the pieces, well, like you have to meet people. Well, how do you meet people? Oh, okay. And you, you know, you have to go all the way back to the very fundamentals. But even if kids, especially girls on the spectrum ask like, well, I don't have any friends or I don't know how to be friends. We're very like often pretty dismissive or we're like, oh, just do the thing. Like, yeah, of course you have friends. You know, you hang out at, you know, Sarah's house every day after school. And it's like, well, what we missed there is that our kid didn't feel like she had a friend or like she even understood what it meant to be a friend. And we just kind of take it for granted that it's understandable and easy and it makes sense to all brains. So that I feel, did I answer your question? I feel like I lost. Yeah, my no, I, I think, um, you know, what it's kind of reminding me of once again is when I, when I have patients who are neurodivergent, you know, oftentimes we'll see like people asking for the breakdown. So, so when I work with people who are neurodivergent, the kind of takeaway I've gotten is that they almost approach life like a video game where it's like there are particular rules and like, what is the what is the equation for friendship? And then they're like, how do I make friends? Okay, I do this, I do this, because that's how they construct their their social interactions, right? When someone right. holds their hand out to me, I need to hold out, and then it's two pumps. Not three pumps, yeah. not four pumps, not one pump. It's two pumps, and then we're done. Right. And and right. so so they'll they'll sort of construct like a rubric for like how to socially interact. And then the the really frustrating thing that I've seen a lot is people will say, you know, I was told that this is what I'm supposed to do, and I checked all the boxes, and it didn't work. And and that's because yes. there's certain things that are assumed that people with advice will give you that that's actually the most critical stuff, right? right. It, it's the stuff that is left out, it, you know, that that everyone sort of takes for granted. Um, that that really is is the most challenging kind of thing, and and yeah. so you know, it, it's really interesting to hear you kind of talk about how you know they get the corrective signals earlier i was a little bit curious about anxiety so you said at some point they start to get anxious can you tell us a little yeah. bit about where that comes from and and how that evolves yeah so um when we think about anxiety um kind of if you zoom out to get like an umbrella understanding of anxiety um what's going on is it's it's a fear-based reaction and so there's often an um, overestimation of both the probability and the magnitude of some kind of danger. So, um, you know, to kind of use an extreme example, like, oh, um, a meteor the size of the United States is going 
to hit my uh, house, right? So huge meteor, like very big magnitude of a danger. And then the probability, it's a guarantee, right? That meteor is going to crash into my house. Um, and then an underestimation of the coping abilities. And if that happens, obviously I can't cope with it because I'm going to die. So now if you kind of put that into social situations, um, that would be like, oh, um, someone is is uh, not just going to kind of like tease me, but someone is going to say awful mm. things to me. And it is absolutely going to happen. And there's no way I can cope with that because I, I can't tolerate like people not liking me. Well, if you put kind of that process into a person who genuinely does not understand social interactions in the way that, you know, probably some of the, or most of the people around them, but they're being forced to execute the behaviors. Well, they are experiencing more negative, you know, uh, feedback. Like you said, there's a rubric. I, um, put my hand out, you know, and then I, I hold it and then I shake two times, but some people, um, put their hand out and they don't want to shake it. They want to do like, you know, something like that. And then they think you're weird. Like what? You don't know how to like do a high five kind of like hand thing or like, instead of shaking a hand, I'm going to put my hand out and then hug you. And it's like, Oh, I wasn't expecting that. What am I supposed to do? Do I hug back? How hard is it? Two hands. Is it one hand? You know? And so there's all of this, like what's going on here. So you're, you are actually getting more negative feedback. So the probability is higher than a neurotypical person who understands social cues. The magnitude probably escalates because at first you're just like a little bit weird, but then you're like definitely the weird kid. Um, and your coping resources are kind of diminished because you, you're walking through life not really understanding what's going on anyway. And so you've just learned your coping is to pretend like it's not happening, which as we all know, that unfortunately doesn't work. Um, and so you develop a very understandable process of like, I don't know what's happening. Something bad is coming my way, but I can't even predict, mm. right? Like I, I can't look at you and know if you want to hug me or handshake me or do like a, you know, like really <laughs> yeah, exactly. slap my <laughs> hand around. That like, <laughs> I mean, and, and I feel like we all got a little dose of this, like, you know, during yeah. COVID and right after it was like, do we shake hands anymore? Do you hug? Do you do the like, um, elbow. you know, some people were doing yeah. like this. Yeah, yeah. Like elbow things or like fist bumps or like, imagine, do you remember like that negative feedback where you went in to like shake a hand or hug someone and they like backed away from you and like, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Like I didn't mean to like violate your boundaries, but though we got little tiny doses of what people on the autism spectrum are experiencing in big ways in most areas of their lives on a pretty like consistent basis. Um, so I, I think that, and then, but think too about how like, we're not identifying girls who are neurodivergent, right? So maybe neurodivergent girls happen to find another neurodivergent girl where it kind of works really well. And so everyone's like, oh, you can't have autism because you have a you're, friend. You have friends. Yes, you have yeah. a friend, right? Or the number of girls that I did um, autism evaluations with um, who all of the adults in their life said, she doesn't have autism. She, she's great with the teachers. She's amazing with my friends, parents saying that. And it's like, yeah, because um, first of all, it is way easier to interact socially with people who are not your peers. That is the most threatening kind of like mm. challenging area. But also, how do we teach girls to talk to adults? There is a very specific rubric mm. for the expectation for a child and especially a girl talking with and interacting with adults. And so it is less inherently threatening. And I have very strong scripts about the ways that I'm supposed to behave here. And then I get powerfully reinforced by that. Um, and so, yeah. Um, more information that my dog is really um, excited about joining this conversation. That's totally fine. Um, All dogs are welcome. <laughs> um, 
um, is, um, you know, like, oh, well, because they're good with adults, they can't have autism. So it's something else. And then again, we just keep dismissing um, things that really we could have identified people who needed more support or just different ways of learning even. Um, so yeah, yeah, there's, there's a, a lot. So speak, speaking of kind of socialization anxiety, can you talk a little bit about social anxiety in women and, and sort of what oh, you yeah. noticed or how it could manifest differently or, you know, just do that whole thing that you do where you talk about developmental perspectives in society and biology. <laughs> and, yeah, just just go again, if you don't mind, please. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think one of the things that just it with the pandemic, I think we are not, I think we, we are seeing like some skyrocketing social anxiety in our um, young people. And I imagine it's happening in adults as well, but um, because obviously I'm, I'm pre predominantly focused on youth. It's really in my face and, and things that I'm reading about. But um, so we kind of talk through like, what is anxiety and how does it come about in people who are neurodivergent? And then I've been talking a lot about autism, but like ADHD is super relevant and basically follows the same trajectory, right? Kids who bounce around the room, boys are allowed to do that until we think, hmm, they're bouncing a little extra. Girls who bounce around the room are immediately given feedback. You don't do that. Absolutely not. You need to sit in your chair. You know, you need to be quiet. Um, so, you know, take what I said about AD autism and you can basically copy and paste it for ADHD. And then there is an overlap between those two as well. So. We used to say you could only have one or the other. And then we learned like, mm, not true. You can actually have both. So that's fun. But so um, for different reasons, people with ADHD are not picking up on social cues because they're kind of picking up on everything all at once and unable to filter the information very well. So they are also having kind of social difficulties. Um, so you've got this kind of like social anxiety piece where I have a lot of um, unpredictable negative social information coming my way and I don't know the right answers and I have like my baseline approach but it doesn't actually work for me every time um, and then you add in the um, social ways of connecting that we have on screens so that there is a big buffer zone first of all you don't have to look at me if I don't want you to in most of our like favorite online platforms um, my physical visibility is not required. And so I can learn how to connect with people without having to think about what do I look like? And there is some really interesting, and I'm sure we, we all do this, right? We all have avatars. We all go online. We all do, I mean, gaming things, whatever, even if it's like a me on the Nintendo systems, right? So you can actually construct your experience in a way that you literally cannot in the like physical world. So I can change my gender, I can change my race, I can change my age. Um, and you know, I grew up when like the internet was first happening and we had like dial up and you know, I could tell people literally anything about me. And the fun thing is, is that you don't even have to stay the same. You can have 10 online interactions and be like a totally different person in each experience and so it really allows you to be more I mean, free but like fluid and experimental so i can kind of like test out ways of being um and then oh hey that didn't i didn't like that and the negative feedback you get online i mean don't get me wrong can be very intense and unpleasant but also is can be depending on your platform controllable i can block you i can just end this conversation and move on to the next room, right? I can get into a different server. So there are ways of kind of like adapting to this different platform of social interaction that can sometimes make socializing easier um, and certainly less overwhelming because you're getting a lot less social feedback. So like, let's just take that fundamental eye contact piece and just take it off the table. There is no eye contact. Um, you know, in in uh, online platform. And so all of a sudden, let's say I'm a person who has social anxiety, and now I have ways of interacting with humans where maybe things go better for me in some situations, and so I can actually connect with people, which now I have a huge discrepancy in my life. Now, 
oh, I have this safe space. I have these connections I can make. And then I go out into the world and it feels even more like, oh, so what do we do when we feel anxious about things? We avoid them. We don't like them. What does that do to our anxiety? Unfortunately, it feeds it. It grows that beast. Hmm. And so you see this kind of like interaction between, holy cow, thank, thank goodness I found this space or these people or this place where I can really connect. But then it almost makes other things worse in some ways, right? And I'm not saying like, don't connect online. Yeah, yeah. So how does connecting online make social anxiety potentially worse? So you said it, it, it feeds it. How, how so? Right. So um, if I am getting my needs met or I'm getting that reinforcement in a, in a specific way, then um, I can say like, hey, when I am this version of myself or this piece of myself online, or even this totally unmasked version of myself online, and I'm getting this really positive, positive pleasant, wonderful reaction, um, then it does kind of like heighten some of the other sources of like, whoa, negativity, and especially, like, it doesn't matter whether it's my full unfiltered version that I get to be reinforced by or whether it's, like, the section of me that this online community gets to know, then, oh, so my unfiltered version is completely unacceptable to the rest of the world. Or, oh, the only part of me that's good is this part that I share with this community, mm. right? And so then you're just really, um, you're getting like this, like feedback so that like, you're kind of, I think, think about like a tree, right? So like we have this beautiful blossoming tree, but like when the tree, you know, who's walking around the world, um, interacts with a certain group or certain people, it's like that group is like, no, we need to trim these branches. You need to stop growing those leaves. We don't like that color of flowers. You need yellow flowers. And the tree is like, I don't know, can I make yellow flowers? I thought I only had purple flowers. But as humans, we can, we can make some of those changes, but they're not necessarily authentic to ourselves or feeling good. And so when we have these additional social influences, it's like, oh, sometimes it's good, but sometimes it's not. And, you know, of course online, we're not gonna get positive feedback everywhere. <laughs> and so it's just, we're adding more sources of that unpredictability of that like, mm. Wait, I know it works sometimes, but like not always, but like sometimes yes. And and so we're just like the chaos and the unpredictability like fuels the, the anxiety. anxiety. Yeah. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And is there are there particular things that you've noticed about you sort of mentioned that, you know, women or, or girls are more expected to socialize, connect with each other. So does social anxiety affect women in a different way? Oh I mean so here's an interesting other gender difference, right? So uh, we think so, yes, because of the physical component and that there are really um, clear cut uh, physical norms of what you need to look like and adhere to, to be a proper girl, to be accepted, accepted by society, even to be called beautiful, right? And some of those things are completely outside of my control. Um, because of how I was, you know, what my body was born as, but like, I'm going to say, no, I have to fit into this norm. Well, um, because of the intense scrutiny on girls and women, um, there is, we thought that that was a really big piece kind of more exclusively to girl. Well, when we started saying, Hey, maybe not everybody has all the, like one size fits all, um, looking at our eating disorder populations, which is like a body centric, right? Um, condition, uh, girls obviously used to be diagnosed that significant, like boys barely even had eating disorders. And if you were a boy with an eating disorder, wow, there was something seriously wrong with you. Well, turns out not super true. Um, boys also have a really hard time with their ridiculous body norms and standards and the need to fit a certain way of looking, being, dressing, acting. Um, and so while social anxiety for girls often is very heavily focused on, on also like, oh, people are going to look at me and laugh at me. People are going to, you know, and 
traditionally, if you look at like men or like famous men, like look at the male celebrities who dress in certain ways and then like female celebrities, like um, I think Adam Sandler is well known for a lot of like celebrity photos of him in like some uh, very athletic um, oversized attire. And it's more just like, oh, that's Adam Sandler. He's so funny. Like he just dresses like that versus like, remember when Billie Eilish came onto the scene and it was like, why is she dressing like a homeless person? And she's wearing trash bags and that's not okay. And does she think anyone's gonna think she's attractive? And it's like, oh, um, you know, really intense negative feedback for girls. And so those are just like some kind of like celebrity version examples of how girls are navigating the world. But I, I'm not sure that we are as different as we think on those gender differences in social anxiety. Um, and then, of course, boys have a lower expectation in general for their social connections. Like men, which, again, I think this is a problem. Men are not really allowed to, like, cry to each other. They're not allowed to have intimate connections because, you know, and we have, like, oh, yeah, that's a whole other thing. And so, like, if a boy has social anxiety, he doesn't have the same societal expectation that he has to be connecting with people aka engaging in one of his more feared experiences mm. versus girls no no if you're a girl who doesn't have girlfriends and isn't going out for girls drinks and you know has a group chat with all of her girlfriends then you know there's something wrong with you so do it even if it's scary or hard or terrifying yeah that's so interesting so uh, i i i if, it, if you're okay with it i want to jump to um uh so we have like a list of questions from the q a which you should have gotten yeah uh, and I think some yeah. of these are sort of like connected. So I'm going to jump to one of those if that's okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, so how would you recommend that women or girls deal with social isolation and loneliness? Everyone assumes you'll have other girlfriends, but many of us don't. Yes. How do you cope without a support yes. network or even a toxic one? Yeah. Um, First of all, I just want to say the questions that this community um, kind of like generated were phenomenal. Just like reading through those questions, I was super excited and just it really reflects like how engaged your community is and how like creative and like um, really like thoughtful, like people are interacting with the information. So um, shout out to all of you out there. Um, but I think this is such a hard question because um, how do you cope without a social support system? My understanding both socially and biologically is we are socially wired creatures. Like our brains are built to need other humans, other people of our species. And so coping without a social support system is really fucking hard. And it, and um, it, like, I wanna say, I just don't recommend doing it, even knowing sometimes it's incredibly challenging to build that social support system. Um, and then, or to step away from, like I've worked with so many young women who have extremely toxic social support systems, or we'll call them social groups. And they're like, you know, we do a pros and cons and we're looking at like, do we leave the friend group or do we stay? And like, heartbreakingly more often it's like it's better to stay with people who are clearly adversely affecting my mental health and not treating me well than it is to be isolated and alone and so you know that that's just like and again coming in like oh as a mental health professional i'm gonna say no that's an unhealthy relationship it's abusive but if you actually look at what a person values and priorities and needs are, a lot of times people say, like, it's better than nothing. And who am I to say, like, oh, you're wrong, right? And so um, summary statement for this first part is, like, you really do need that social support. And I want to just take a moment. It's really, really hard to build healthy social support systems. And so kind of I think with anything social, where do you start at like your very first baby step? And the last time um, we hung out here, we talked about kind of thinking about friends or social groups in like layers um, and that you don't start at the like most intimate layers. So you start with casual interactions, 
um, shared interests, pleasant conversations. Um, and sometimes that needs to be like artificially created. So that means like, hey, if you see a person, no matter how they look, saying like, how's the weather today? Or, you know, commenting on shoes. And then sometimes like, oh, that leads to a conversation. And then a conversation, if you're, you know, in a shared space, you bump into them more often. And then you can, you know, talk more, diversify the topic. So now it's like, oh, I'm learning more about you. Um, and then like initiating plans is a big one that is like pretty terrifying. Um, and kind of the biggest step in going from, oh, we have casual conversations here and there, or I see you in class or at work or, you know, in my building, but like creating plans would be the next step to actually then building that into, from an acquaintance into a friendship. Um, so I think taking it slowly and just being kind to yourself. So as you're trying to connect with other people, we so quickly go into a, they don't like me because there's something wrong with me. They don't like me because I'm dumb, ugly, flawed, broken, whatever the mean things are that we're saying to ourselves. So instead just kind of thinking, hey, that didn't work out. We're not the right fit for each other. We are not, you know, it just isn't the right. There are lots of people I really enjoy and respect as humans that I don't want to spend my free time with. It's not a negative thing. It just is, we're not all, what did I say? I'm, like, we're not all chicken nuggets. Like not everybody's gonna love us. So, but then there are vegetarians. See, not even everybody loves chicken nuggets. <laughs> yeah, so that that's, so so kind of what I'm hearing from you is first of all, I, I, I and I completely, completely agree by the way that I, you know, I, I see a lot of people in abusive relationships and, um, and you know, people from the outside just don't, understand right like they just don't like they're like how on earth can you stay with this person and, and i think a lot of times what we lose sight of or what took me years to understand as a as a psychiatrist is that why are you with this person because this is actually better than the alternative which is such yeah. a scary thought that like most people yes. cannot fathom depending on the life that you've led right that yes. like this thing that seems so wrong to you is a step up from what the alternative is and yes. we see that with toxic friend groups, uh, especially in our community where we talk about, you know, su toxic support, where it's sort yeah. of like you have to take, I mean, it's almost like taking your medicine where it's like, okay, in order to fight off the bone crushing loneliness, I have yeah. to tolerate this person's assholery. I'm the person yes. that always texts first, always texts first, always texts first. But if I don't text them, they will never text me back. And if I don't text yeah. them, I won't see anyone. Yeah. yeah. So this is sort of the reality that that some people experience. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of MMR matchmaking rating. Um, no. Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> It's a gaming concept. So, so when 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 you play a when you play a video game and you win a match, you will gain some level of points, mm -hmm. and then the next time I queue up, my opponent will have the same level of points that I have. Okay. And and the, the interesting thing is that you know when I look at this community, I almost see like there's like a social MMR where like people who know how to socialize will yeah. end up socializing with other people who know how to socialize. Right. And then what we sort of end up with is like sometimes there are people who have struck difficulty socializing and then it can feel like, OK, all the normal people don't want to hang out with me. And so you're sort of stuck hanging out with all the people who don't know how to socialize. Yeah. And and so this is something that like is really challenging. I see this in the most bizarre places. So online D&D groups is a really good example. Yeah. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Dungeons and Dragons, but yeah, yeah. like some of the most toxic situations i've seen like socially or in like dungeons and dragons groups where people have power and some people don't and your dm is like yeah. fucking power tripping and they don't like something that yeah. you're doing and you can't advocate from yourself it's it's such a mess right oh and, yeah and mm -hmm. sometimes that's because the dm like the only reason they dm is because they're not capable of doing that back and forth that allows them in, to maintain relationships so i think one of the other real challenges that we kind of have to acknowledge is that like sometimes the reason it's hard to find social groups is because is a society we're atrophying our social skills yes and so it becomes harder and harder i don't think that there's something wrong with you i think there's something wrong with all of us and it is becoming harder 
we are seeing yes. more and more objective evidence that even, for example, like dating and, and romantic relationships and things like that are becoming like more objectively difficult. Yes. Um, we are seeing an increase in loneliness from men and women. Uh, yeah. And, and so... And adults to kids. It's like, it's happening around the world yeah, yeah. to all ages, to all genders. I mean, it is, yeah. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's I, I appreciate your answer so much that first of all, like, you know, sometimes toxic relationships are kind of better than the alternative. And, and that's because, yeah. as you said, we are social creatures. So I, I think the interesting thing about going through med school is really understanding that the mind is the only organ in our body that requires things outside of you in order to be healthy. So I can yeah. like basically take almost 100% care of my cardiovascular health without anything outside of me. If I eat right and I exercise, I have 100% control over my cardiovascular health. Not technically right. 100% because there's mental influences sure. on that and then genetics and whatnot. Yeah. But generally speaking, I can take, can take care of my kidneys. I can take care of my liver. I can take care of my heart. The only thing that I can't take care of by myself is my mind. Unless yeah. you're a monk, in which case, but I wouldn't <laughs> recommend that. Wait, but actually, so there is literature that says the reason that works for some people is because they are connected, but just not to a physical human. They're so deeply connected to the spirituality that it functions socially. And so that like people who live in, they're not like a monk, like, well, I mean, like a, the word monk, right, is, is somebody who lives in isolation because they're deeply connected to a spiritual practice or a belief system, even if it's not like a religious faith, right? Versus a person who is completely isolated and living on like a, you know, mountain top. That's, that's a great point. So it's, it's interesting because, you know, a lot, a lot of times we view monks in a particular way, but monks are actually yeah. quite socially connected too because they live in monasteries yeah. with groups of right. other monks. Um, I, right. I also think that a lot of times when we sort of think about non monks as being non-materialistic, they have the luxury of being non-materialistic yeah. because they don't have to worry right. about how they're getting a roof over their head. They don't have to worry yep. about where their meals are coming from. Those things are actually yep. the highest security that you can get in terms of living rent free and getting yep. free pro food provided is actually to be a monk. S safely and consistently too. Yeah, absolutely. And and yep. the, the other thing, it's really interesting because if you look at some of these studies on transcendental spiritual experiences as, and which we kind of also get into with psychedelics, one of the things that happens is our sense of self breaks down and our sense of connectedness on a neuroscientific level actually increases. Yes. And, and so it, it's so interesting because when we think about compassion, compassion, if you really look at some of these old texts, they say that compassion is not something you have to try to do as a monk. Compassion naturally arises when you start to realize that you and someone else are one and the same. So I don't mm -hmm. need compassion towards my hand. I naturally take care of my hand because I see it as part of me. So if you look mm -hmm. at some of these old texts, they say that as you do these practices, you will realize that there's a oneness between all things. And the mm -hmm. realization of that oneness naturally results in compassion because I don't walk around slapping my hand, right? Because it's part of me. Why would I hurt it? And so you right. start to treat others as you would treat yourself. Yeah. And now we even have sort of this interesting, uh, you know, evidence from neuroscience studies and things like that on the deactivation of the default mode network and some of these other parts of the brain that start to break down, which is where our sense of individuality comes from. And when we mm -hmm. break that down, then we feel we sort of have some idea of a neuroscientific mechanism of like feeling one with the universe. So I never really thought about monks as connected, but that makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it is very fascinating. Um, yeah, so that's so cool. So just if I can switch gears for a second, because we, we've got maybe about 30 minutes left and we have so many questions. Um, yeah. So do you have any advice for handling unrealistic beauty standards? I can't help but feel inferior because of my looks and I don't know how to start accepting myself. Again, right? Like these are some real big, big questions. Um, and I was... Um, in grad school, one of my colleagues was doing research on, she was an eating disorder specialist, but she was doing research on body image. Um, and I'm going to flub the numbers, but you know, when a group of young adult women were surveyed about how happy they were with their body, something like 97% 
were moderately or more dissatisfied with the way that we look. If you think about that, like, are there only 3% of women in the, in the country that are beautiful? Like, of course not. When I think about walking around and looking at people, right? I'm like, oh, you know, like that person's beautiful, that person, they also don't all look the same. Some of them do, but you know, like you're, we are thinking at, about other people like, oh, they're so beautiful. This is also applicable. Like when you look at like, oh, I thought I was fat. And then I looked at pictures of myself during a period of time where I thought I was really fat. And then I was like, oh, wow, I wasn't fat at all. Right. So if you kind of think like both of those concepts, like either within myself, when I was like, oh, now I'm out of that phase and I'm looking at it and I'm like, huh, weird. I'm not as judgy of myself as I was or thinking about the way that we all just kind of like hate ourselves. Clearly the facts do not match with the perception, right? Is the kind of like, as well those those kind of pieces are showing us. So um, there, there are two ways that I think you could go about working on your like body image. One is you can start externally and you can work a lot on complimenting, praising and identifying beauty in a lot of people, not just the ones that are like the filtered social media influencers, the celebrities, the gorgeous people, because also none of those people actually look like that, right? So um, how do I show more compassion and praise and open up my perception of beauty and body image, right? How do I look at that outside of myself and kind of bring that positivity and change my perception externally? which then oftentimes I am after I get good at that, I start to be more like aware and mm. accepting and loving of my own look. Right. Um, and then for some people it works better starting with myself. Right. So looking in, when I'm looking in the mirror, when I'm looking at pictures. Um, so there's some research in this with like, um, they've done research on like moms with daughters and um, how um, if you deliver an intervention to moms, about how they talk about their bodies and their image, like in pictures or in the mirror, um, or the compliments they give themselves in front of their daughters, you affect the daughter's body image and visions of beauty. And so, you know, can I, but you also affect the moms, right? So I'm, I'm a mom, I'm doing this for my daughter, but then I'm now believing mm. like, um, right, that my body is actually like, oh, you know, why do your boobs look like that? Well, it's because my boobs did this cool thing and fed you for like a year or however long, right? And so now all of a sudden, what we're thinking about with all those negative judgment words about the way that like my body has changed or the way that my body looks now, now I'm framing it in a light of like, holy cow, that is really cool. And the more I talk about it, the more I'm like, oh, so I'm not thinking about it as, oh, it's the right shape and wrinkle free or this or that or size, but I'm thinking about it from like a different lens. And so that can be another way of kind of shifting, right? Like my eye ripped and fell in a crosswalk on a major six lane street yesterday. Like I went down, um, tumbled, had a hard time getting up. And so I was really embarrassed. And then afterwards, I was like, how cool is my body? Like, I basically bounced off the street today. I mean, don't <laughs> get me wrong, I have a little bruise on my knee. But like, when we start thinking about our bodies beyond, like, what are my legs looking like? What size are my jeans? But we try to like expand the way we're looking at our bodies. That's another way that you can really transform. Don't try to gaslight yourself of like, oh, you know, a size six isn't that big. I don't have to be a size two. Like you're just buying into the beauty standard that of what I have to look like, right? Oh, if I just color my hair a certain way or learn the right contouring techniques with my makeup or, you know, lift whatever weight, that that actually is not going to be the thing that's going to get you to that acceptance because you're still staying in that narrow lane of what is good. So how do you kind of like zoom out and really look yeah. at things like, you know, like I I, I can walk. Um, I can go up and down stairs. I mean, those are kind of like, yeah, that's some people would say that's a low bar, but like look at other bodies and can they, you know, walk long distances? Can they trip and fall 
on some concrete and just stand back up and keep walking. Um, so just kind of like thinking about things in a different way to really kind of expand your view of body and beauty and good things. Yeah, so so that's so interesting. Uh, so if I understood you correctly, you were saying that when we teach mothers interventions to try to support their body, their daughter's body image, that the mother's sense of body image also improves. Was that? Did I understand that correct? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's so interesting because I also I've seen evidence of the flip, which is that when you teach parents, uh, when you treat anxiety in parents. When you have an anxiety mm. disorder in a parent and an anxiety disorder in the child, if you medicate mm -hmm. the parent and you see clinical improvements, mm -hmm. the child's anxiety mm -hmm. will improve. Oh, yeah. You know, so so ha having, having a calm, which is not that surprising, but, you know, having yeah. just treating the parent will, by definition, treat the child. Because we're treating a system. Yeah. Where it's not just like, like, they don't exist, you know, theme of our conversation. We don't exist alone in the world. So if you can, how do you intervene on the system in a way that is going to create, create change? Yeah. So, so, you know, I, I'm a little bit, if it's okay, Michaela, I'm going to push back on some of the stuff that you said, because the low bar yeah. seems like, you know, so like, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm with you. And I also think some of this stuff is, is just, it, it feels a little bit gaslighty to me. So that's what I'm kind of, I love that you kind of talked yeah. about gaslighting yourself. So I have a perspective on this, but, you know, just to kind of push back. So you kind of mentioned, OK, like the, the reason that my breasts look the way that they do is because I, I fed you. And, and we all know that from a medical yeah. perspective, you know, feeding multiple babies. Um, and I've noticed as a is a honestly as a medical doctor that uh, the second child that a woman has oftentimes uh, changes her body way more than the first. And and mm. so I don't know if that's anecdotal or if there's data behind it or it's certainly anecdotal, but. Okay. Um, it's just something I've observed that that you know. Oh yeah, I was gonna ask if if age moderates that or mediates so, so, that. So so that, that, like, that's why second... I I I don't know. So right, so it could be okay. the mitigating factor that you always have a second child after you have your first, and so you're gonna the age is gonna that could be a confounding okay, variable. Older. Okay. But um, and, and then something about third child, fourth child, fifth child, the body seems to change less for my the patients mm -hmm. that I've I've worked with. Um, okay. And so, but, you know, we sort of have these certain beauty standards of, of what breasts are considered attractive. And then after your breasts serve this function of literally swelling drastically so that you can produce store and mm -hmm. and disseminate large amounts of milk, that, that the, there's going to be a physiological change in the breast. And mm -hmm. so, like, yeah, it's cool that I sustained life. Like, that's a good thing. But my breasts <laughs> still look different, right? They're not, they mm -hmm. don't look the way that they, they, they're, they're supposed to. They really aren't consistent with beauty standards that we sort of mm -hmm. have around us. And mm -hmm. so like uh, what I kind of like, what, what my instinctive response is, and I'm putting myself in the shoes of my patients and trying to channel yeah. what I imagine they would say, and maybe I'm not doing them justice here, is that like, you know, they don't look as good as they used to. Like, sure, we can work on self-acceptance, but, it, sure. you know, yeah. it, I mean, can't I, I? I still they're still not as attractive as some the way they the way that I used to be ten years ago. Let alone comparing yourself to women who haven't had children or or whatever. And then yeah. also, it's it's kind of like you say, like, well, yeah, my my body bounced off. Like, great, you're you know you're made of rubber there. That's good. But there's <laughs> yeah. a it's a completely different bucket of stuff. Like one is like functional mm -hmm. utility, and one mm -hmm. is like I'm ugly. Right. Mm -hmm. And that there are other people out there who are beautiful. So that seems to me to be like a pretty big gap. Yeah. So um, what we're talking about is like diversifying the, the information we're considering around our body. Right. So um, like we are socialized and this is probably not the platform to do this on, but we're socialized because like of the multi-trillion dollar beauty industry to need to look a certain way. Those things are by and large completely made up things. And I don't know if you've seen any of the like um, time uh, switches of like, this is what it was to be beautiful in this time, in this time, in this time. And kind of like going like, um, 
So um, that that is socially constructed. That that's like a made up thing, and it's made up because it generates a lot of money for a lot of people. Is so that I can, you know, constantly have you buying different products, buying different clothes, trying different diets, et, et, cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's like a that's a whole separate thing, right? But so when we're thinking about it, um, what we want to do is we want to. I'm yes, oh, fake made up. So we still live in this society, right? So I can't say like, oh, it's all made up. So who cares? Don't pay attention to it. This is still the society I live in. Just like ABA is designed to help people on the autism spectrum to function in the society we live in, because this is this is what we have. So I'm not trying to say like, oh, you know, forget society. I don't know how realistic that is. What I'm saying is the more we can diversify the way that we look at things. So um, the way that I look at my body in the mirror and I criticize the way that I look at it. And some people say, oh, compare yourself to others, you know, and there's like, you know, compare yourself. Well, I'm not as, oh, well, I can walk. I'm not in a wheelchair. So that means like my body is good. Ah, that doesn't really fit very well with me. And there is some literature that supports that as being potentially helpful. But I think when we look at, instead of my body and the only way of being beautiful and the only way of having value, right? Cause that's what beauty is. It's like the value of my physical appearance or physical shape is in this one narrow definition of that. So when I can expand my opportunities to have value in my physical being, then we also start seeing, so with any black and white thinking, right? Once you, diversify and now there's there is black and there is white and then there's like a range of gray all of a sudden being that black and white is less important and i can now see how i still fit in to some of those things in ways that i wasn't able to perceive before because there's a perception piece here where it's not just factual that i am fat or misshapen or ugly right it is there's a perception piece that we are often the worst judges of for our own selves. And so when we can diversify the value, first of all, now I'm seeing that my body has value in a lot of different ways, but now I'm also can peel away some of that negative perception that I'm putting on myself so that I have, again, more of that, like, oh, okay. So like, I guess, you know what? mine isn't that, that big or you know whatever the pores are not that huge I guess you actually can't notice them versus if you're so focused on how big your pores are and you need to get them smaller and you know like there's lots of products you can buy to make your pores smaller or cover them up or do the makeup or whatever the thing but when I start looking at all of the pieces like oh um you know what I have a sister who is very sad that she has some aging on her skin and she's been really talking about like yeah I have aging on my skin because I have so much fun outside and I get to do all these cool activities on the beach and at the pool and you know in the mountains that I wouldn't otherwise have had and so now I'm again adding value and looking at these pieces in a different way does she still sometimes look in the mirror and be like oh I have wrinkles I could get Botox sure and it the impact to her emotional well-being is ab absolutely uh, like mitigated or like her sense of physical beauty and self is way better because she's been able to incorporate some of these pieces. Okay. Does that, that makes sense. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I love the way that you sort of said that. So ultimately if we think about beauty, beauty is a, is one source of value. Yes. Right. And so, <laughs> so then if we really look at what's the root that we're talking about, it's about value and what is the value of my body? And, yeah. and beauty is just one slice of it. And that's something that I think that a lot of people can intellectually understand is that, you know, like I'm good for any number of things. One of them is being beautiful and another is, is that I can, my body can bring me pleasure. It can bring me joy. I, you know, I can do fun things with it. Um, and, and so that, that's really interesting. So it's, it's not even necessarily challenging the perception directly, but the, the first step is to expand the scope. And then, yeah. then, and I'm, I'm with you a hundred percent about, uh, you know, the, the value of creating a non black and white system. So the problem is also if, like from black and white systems, like there's no way to progress. 
right? Because it's binary. So like either you're beautiful or you're not. So if you sort of think about, okay, if we assume a system where there are ugly people and beautiful people, what does the ugly person do? Nothing. There's nothing to do because there's no sense of incremental change because you're mm -hmm. not beautiful. And that is a fixed object. Mm -hmm. The moment that you start to add shades of gray, now I can like move in the right direction. Right. I can do mm -hmm. something a little bit for my appearance. I can get my hair cut. I can start using deodorant. I can start showering. I can do whatever like s small things that will move me in the right yeah. direction. And and I really yeah. love how you, you kind of sort of talked about just understanding that your value. And I think that's the big problem. That's kind of how I approach it as a clinician is, is sort of really tackling this idea of like the value of beauty. A and what I try to help my patients do is understand that you may not be beautiful. OK, you know, so what? Yeah. Yeah. And, and then that's where we get to a lot of really interesting, like, cognitive constructions mm -hmm. about beauty. Um, and then once we get to that point, I, I think it's you also pointed out that this is something that I think is very, very under almost underdeveloped in in the field of like psychiatry is like focusing on cleaning perception. Um, so mm -hmm. in, in the yogic system, uh, the, I mean, uh, perception is actually viewed as critically important. And then mm -hmm. if you look at kind of what's going on, especially with social media and stuff, I think a lot of these are problems of perception where, where mm -hmm. you know, you, you, I'll ask people like when they have a particular belief, like it's impossible to do X, Y, Z. Awesome. Where do you get that information? It's usually one or two lived experiences or a small amount of lived experiences followed by a mental construction from social media. So you fall into this group and there's research on like online radicalization or online drift, mm -hmm. which is just, yep. you know, once you sort of view yourself as an ugly person, then the kind mm -hmm. of cons uh, content you uh, absorb will make that belief more radical over time and right. also far more concrete because now everyone out there also has this experience. And who is everyone? Mm -hmm. It's what the, the algorithm feeds you. Right. And then there's other inherent problems like what the algorithm benefits from, which is which is to a certain degree creating insecurity and, and ping ponging yeah. your emotions. Um, right. And so the, the more I think people figured out a while ago that if you make someone laugh, they'll move to a different platform soon enough. But if you can make someone angry, yeah, if you can make someone feel insecure, that actually causes them to engage in content more and more, more and more. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I think we have time for maybe one more. And I'd love to ask you this question. So this is a, kind of my favorite question. What is currently a woman's mental health topic that we are not aware of slash not talking about enough? Is there something you observe that we should know about? Um, I had such a laugh when I read this question because I was like, oh, and it, how ironic for it to come on the heels of what you just said about the algorithm and the content yeah. we speak, right? Our community is, is that, awesome. They're like amazing. Yeah. I, I'm not sure what other people don't know because my feeds and the things that I'm reading and that I'm hearing about are all constructed on my approach <laughs> to life, which then reinforce and keep going so like i've been reading stuff about cognitive and mental load for months i thought everybody was talking about it turns out not right and so um i think i think we've already covered kind of like mental load um another thing that i've been seeing is that like when when women entered the workplace and so you you are you also kind of alluded to like the dual income so we shifted economic contributions to the household without ever shifting the social contributions like women are still expected to clean and cook and grocery shop and care for the kids and men are expected to get the money but now we have women who are also getting the money and in some relationships are earning more money so like there's there's like that kind of like wait now we need to redistribute you know it's it's a full system with you know movement across um but I think one of the things that we haven't covered, oh, and it slipped out of my mind. Oh, a, a thing that we haven't covered um, that I think is, I'm seeing a lot on, on my platforms is um, like the things we think about as we navigate the world. So like particularly um, like we don't, 
like a year ago, my boyfriend and I were walking our dog at night and he wanted to cut through an alley. So dark alley. I would literally never, even with a dog, walk, I, I have a really big dog, um, walk down an alley at night. Like that is just the thing that would never happen. And it, he was like, why? Why would we not go down this alley? And so I think that's another thing that we're like looking at is, is that there are, that women are now kind of like talking about the fact that there are a lot of places, so just like the social roles and the, the masking that neurodivergent women have to do is like, it, it seems like we're starting to kind of open up about these hidden experiences. And by hidden, I just mean that like, we as women have accepted them as this is just what you do versus men never even, most men never even knowing that this, these are the things that you need to, that women are thinking about on a regular basis. And so whether that, you know, dark alleys or, um, jogging with two headphones in, um, I would never do that, you know? So like, there are some safety pieces, um, but there are also just like, um, we were talking about wrapping presents. I don't fit into the traditional female version of this because now I either don't wrap presents and just hand them to people, um, or I like duct tape from like newspaper. Um, but that there is a lot of the like the ways we then judge women for not conforming to some of those standards, and that it is so built into our thought processes that we don't that other people are not thinking about like, oh, I just judged the shit out of you for doing that. Um, breastfeeding, right? If you breastfeed, your boobs look real unattractive after you do that. Turns out if you don't breastfeed, you are shamed to hell and back because you are not doing your job as a woman feeding your child. Oh, and by the way, formula is really, really expensive. Not because it's like hard to manufacture, but because we can financially punish women for not feeding their children, which is a free thing that you should be doing. And so I think that there are some of these pieces that it's like, we've been doing them without thinking about like, hmm, I wonder if that was a good choice or if we need to keep doing it this way. And that I think, which then opens up the conversation for other groups. So now men can say, yeah, but I'm not allowed to cry. I don't, I don't get to have feelings other than anger. I'm allowed to be angry. And so now we're looking at and really uncovering the uh, physical insecurities that men have, but also the like uh, emotional isolation that men experience. And so like we've been focusing today, obviously on women's mental health, and there are so many things that are super relevant for women. But I think that like the term feminist is something that sounds like, oh, now girls are the best instead of boys being the best. But the intention of the word was to say, hey, let's look at this and zoom out of like gender and saying that one is better than the other, that like we can kind of all exist and all do different things and all be empowered separately. Um, so I just think that part is super cool that we are really kind of deconstructing and looking into some of these things. And that doesn't mean that as a girl, you can't be dainty or prefer ballet or be a stay at home mom. There, there are value in all of these, both traditional female things, but also in the non-traditional things. Um, so those are things that I think that I'm seeing a lot on my platform. So I don't know if other people are talking about them or thinking about them because I'm yeah. thinking about them a lot. That, that's, that's, that's such a, such a mental health professional response, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's I like know. acknowledging your own perceptual, like, you know, I, I don't know if what's being talked about and it's, yeah. it's so interesting. I think one of the things that kind of shocked me is that, you know, I had sort of, I was vaguely aware that women face a lot of discrimination. The thing that mm -hmm. shocked me the most um, as a mental health professional is how much that discrimination comes from other women. And oh and, and, yeah, and, and you know, I, I think you mentioned like the breastfeeding thing is just like one example, but like the the thing that that shocked me so much because of how uniform it is is in the field mm -hmm. of finance women are not allowed to have babies until they're like 35. And and what happens is it's interesting because like if a dude, so first of all, it's not their male superiors who are telling them this because like right. they, they get sued to kingdom come. And, and so, sure. so, but what it is, is it's, it's like the female managing directors who are like, yep. fuck you. Yeah. I had to wait until I was 38 
39 mm-hmm. IVF and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you're not I had to sacrifice my 20s and then I had to like put in the hours and even my 30s. And then this was when I was allowed to have children. This is the sacrifice. I made the sacrifice. This is our industry. This is what you need to do too. And, and oh, just, yeah. just the uniformity of that experience was shocking to me. Oh, yeah. 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 And when I when I just started my career, one of my colleagues, um, we had finished our training and she got pregnant. And at lunch, when the rest of the kind of department found out, literally like two people away, so not even behind backs or anything, these two women are talking about how my colleague is an absolute idiot for getting pregnant. What is she thinking? She has no right to be pregnant this early in her career, and she is going to ruin the work that she's doing for doing that, and it makes us all look bad kind of a thing. Like... So it's not even like finance, you know, like, oh, math. So obviously men, men do that more. Like, no, you're, you're completely spot on these like biases and these experiences. We, we all do them, whether we identify as women or, or, or not like doing them to each other, um, in, in big ouchy ways. Yeah. I I think it's, so that was really surprising to me because I think there's a fair amount of like discrimination that is gender-based but I, I was surprised by how like a specific flavor of discrimination tends to come from the opposite gender or your own gender um just in, in, oh, yeah. in gender dynamics and i was just stunned when when i was you know talking to my patients about this stuff um we do have a a, a couple minutes so i i have one kind of last question because now we're talking a little bit about this so do you have time for one more question yeah Okay. Sure. And there's a whole host of stuff that we haven't gotten to, like gender identity and sexuality and stuff. So we're going to have to yeah. do that later. But um, how do I stop fearing platonic friends and family relationships with men? <laughs> yeah. Um, also, yet another like great question. Um, and so uh, fear is typically treated with exposure, right? When you're afraid of something, you do the thing and then you learn. Um in the context of what we were just talking about, some slash most slash many women have experienced genuinely negative experiences with men. And so, you know, um, I get this question a lot of times from women who have had specifically very negative experiences, whether like emotionally abusive relationships or have experienced some form of sexual assault. And um, it is actually not safe to just say, just go be friends with men again. Um, So really um, what we wanna think about when you're trying to kind of get back, either get back into or get into any kind of platonic relationships with male people in your environment is to actually start for yourself by identifying what are your, we call them safety cues, but like what are your green flags basically to like use kind of current terminology. So how do you know that a man is safe or that you want to be around them what are the the green flags that are a sign that you want to be looking for and then what are the red flags, right so what are those danger cues what are the things and sometimes those come from outside of us but also sometimes they come from inside of us and we are sometimes so socialized to gaslight ourselves right um, get over it. He's just trying to talk to you. He's just a friend, da, 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 whatever, whatever. But if you are feeling like, mm, I'm not sure about this, you don't need to be able to point to like a, oh, this is the reason. You can just trust yourself if that is an effective red flag cue for you. So, and everybody has different ones, right? So I can't, some people don't have a very good identifier of like safe versus not in the way they feel because they're just kind of globally like, Mm, men you so maybe that's not one of your red flags but just really trying to break down and i'm not saying like oh somebody who has a good degree it's not like that right it's finding what a the man who looks me in my eyes when i'm wearing a low-cut shirt might be a safety cue a green flag right or it might just be um a guy who likes the you know, silly like Candy Crush game that I play. So just like finding your green flags, finding your red flags and being just because someone has a green flag or a red flag in the beginning doesn't mean that there are not other flags as well. So just always assessing that 
um, to ground yourself in the, oh, this is an actually okay relationship versus a, hmm, there might be a danger here. That's so helpful. Thank you. Because I think those are, these are some of the very like concrete things that people don't know. I, I think um, we're actually going to do something, which you're welcome. I think it's a great segue. Uh, okay. So sometimes, you know, in our community, people are like, we can talk about things abstractly, but then people are like, how do I actually like do this thing? One of the things that I'm mm -hmm. super proud of in, in this community is that we focus a lot about how. Mm -hmm. um, and and so I, I, I want to, I think we're at, I know we had talked about two hours, so I want to sort of respect that limit. I just also wanted to share with you so we can sort of close out. If you want to hang around, you're absolutely more than welcome to. Um, there's one particular post that we're going to address because there's a little bit of uh I don't know if drama is the right word. There's there's some contentious. So sometimes what happens in our community is we're a place where echo chambers collide. And I think this mm. is actually really healthy um, because people yeah. are coming from these places where safe spaces or call them whatever you want to that are, can sometimes be right. incredibly toxic. Um, but places where, you know, some kind of some people congregate with a particular set of views and then they reinforce that particular perspective. And I think yeah. for whatever reason, we've bit become a place where we have a lot of women entering our community, but we also have a lot of incels. And then when these two groups mm -hmm. meet, there can be some kind of tension or clash, which I think our moderators mm -hmm. have done an awesome, awesome, awesome job of navigating through mm -hmm. and really thinking about like, this is a place like it's not a place to vent. Um, mm -hmm. This is a place to focus on growth. And so... Mm -hmm you know, sharing your experience is a part of that, but it's not like a place for you to come and like vomit everything. Like there are venting spaces on the internet. That's totally fine. That's not actually what our goal is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're going to address actually a post about someone who, who said like, you know, I have this, I hate all men, but they sort mm -hmm. of talk about, they're not saying all men are bad. In fact, quite the opposite. They mm -hmm. say, I, I had a, a group of traumatic experiences growing up and I recognize that this mm -hmm. thinking is wrong, but I don't know what to do about it. So this, this post was mm -hmm. quite um, divisive, and so we, mm -hmm. we were going to try to address it directly. You're welcome to stick around if you want to, but I also don't want to keep sure. you. Um, okay. Yeah. I I can hang out for a little bit, and then um, I just want to say, like, I love that this is a place where you say echo chambers collide, because that means that this is very specifically combating the negative influences of that algorithm. It is a problem to be existing in rabbit holes. And so how do we get more opportunities to connect with people where we get our views challenged and can really grow? So I'm, I'm definitely here okay. for it. Okay, so I'm going to, so let, let's go ahead and, okay, let, let, then let's talk about it. Um, let me go ahead and switch a couple of things. So let me just make sure. Um, so I just got to check one or two things. Uh yeah, so let me do this. I'm going to move over to a couple of things, so just bear with me. You're going to be off camera, okay? Um, just because okay. I'm going to share I'm going to share a post. Okay? Um so and then uh this is where oh. So you'll also get to see it in in you know, live in action. Um how the kinds of things that we struggle with and and what we sort of shoot for so what i'll do is i'll go ahead and try to screen share with you michaela so you can see what the, everyone mm -hmm. on the stream can see um and then everyone can hear you so they, they won't be able to see you but you will be able to okay. uh you know they can hear what you're saying so you, you're welcome to chime in okay can you see this this post yeah okay so i'm gonna go ahead and switch to this and now we should be good. Okay, so so people should be able to hear you too. So we had a post a couple days ago um, that says, I hate almost all men. So this post may upset some, but I ask you to actually read it first. This post is entirely about my feelings, which I do not believe are fact and are instead based in my life experiences for better or worse. I recognize they are logically flawed thoughts and not legitimate. This is an account of my internal thoughts. I'm a woman and I hate men. I'm 23 years old, recently graduated with a computer science degree and worked in software engineering at the same company for the past 2.5 years while completing university. I work entirely with men. I'm both the only woman in the room and the youngest. 
In a professional environment, this doesn't bother me, and I have no problem with wor working with having daily interactions or being polite to men. I take it as a badge of honor to be in the boys' club, as men are often visibly sur surprised by my success. I'm somewhat pretty with big boobs, so of course a bimbo. Men face no threat from me, and you would never know anything about it from meeting me. They, they give me far more trouble than I give them. I've had men openly ignore me in group projects, pretend I'm not speaking, refuse to ask me about code I designed and work it and wrote at work, and instead ask my boss, insinuate I'm f fucking my boss, say my success is because of my looks or being diversity higher, among other things. But I strongly dislike and, ex and am extremely suspicious of men. Any man I meet, I feel... I know he must have dark and disgusting secrets behind a polite facade. I believe every man has deeply hurt women one way or another. Whether this is denying rapes, sexually humiliating girls in their class when they were kids, sharing nudes, domestic violence, or just being openly misogynistic, it is all the same to me. They have all contributed to this massive issue of misogyny and the pervasive trauma all women seem to endure at the hands of men. I often believe men are very sick individuals. I was hurt throughout my entire life by men and see this is the root of my issue. My stepfather abused me emotionally, most often by sexually humiliating and mocking me. He ostracized me from my family, though we lived together. My siblings, his children, my half-siblings, haven't spoken to me in 10 years. They would walk by without hello. My mother is a sweet woman and I love her to death, but spineless and unable to stand up for her, herself or me. I was repeatedly told I was stupid, a whore, a troublemaker, a problem, and a loser. He accused me of being a prostitute at 10. I was just a depressed kid. My biological father died in an accident when I, when I was 11, which made me spiral into depression. He was a nice dude as far as I recall, but still a, a man with men's faults. I spent most of my time alone in my room, scared of the sounds of the house. I was sexually abused by men online from 11 onward due to my emotional issues and lack of attention at home. My grandfather groped me from 8 to 12, I was raped at 15, and rumors spread around the school I had falsely accused someone of rape after confiding in a friend, and causing me to lose all my friendships and be openly hated at school. This gave other boys permission to sexually harass me, even escalating to groping me and telling people it was worth it. My rapist was celebrated. Another girl accused him as well before me, but she was also told she was a, a liar, he was popular, we were weird. Later on, boy, boys shared my underage nude images between each other. My first boyfriend constantly harassed me about nudes and sex. My second boyfriend coerced me into sex multiple times. I could go on and on about the things that men have done to me, but I think I've, I've got the picture across. Uh, oh, wow, this goes on for a while. Okay. Even writing this, I'm anticipating a response akin to, well, maybe you shouldn't have acted like such a whore or none of this would have happened. Take some accountability, pick better. This is what I expect from men. When men respond like this, I believe they feel defensive about their own actions and subconsciously guilty, so they lash out. They see a woman say that actions similar to ones they took are evil and affected her and needs to distance themselves immediately. One part of me recognizes my hypocrisy. I hate men for hating women non-discriminately, but I hate men non-discriminately. Another half of me tells me that my thoughts and feelings are a valid worldview, and it is constantly reinforced through day-to-day -day interactions and through my entire life, stories from friends, and much else. I cannot seem to decide if my worldview is a valid response to misogyny or a simple fear response due to trauma. I cannot decide if I feel bad about it or not. I cannot decide if I have a phobia or, I, or am a simple bigot. Maybe both things can be true, and the world is misogynistic, but my reaction to it is irrational. I've gone to therapy and resolved my depression, but didn't bother to tackle this worldview. I felt there was no point. Men will do these things to me again, and I will be right back in the place, in the same place again. I really do not know how to resolve these feelings, but I would like to stop being pre-judgmental to men. It is also annoying to be constantly fearful and suspicious. Even when I know a man well, I'm waiting for him to reveal himself. I know some men can be good as I grant an exception to my boyfriend of seven years. <laughs> I've had male friendships in the past that were somewhat positive, even though they uh, usually turn negative. I also recognize women can be bad as well and have seen female abusers in action, just at a far lesser rate. I take male tales of abuse with healthy, healthy doses of suspicion. My stepfather claimed my mother and I had made his life miserable, abused him, and made him a prisoner in his own home. This colors my reasoning. 
I don't particularly see my lines of reasoning as different to that of an incel and recognize that likely ha they likely had opposite experiences to me, which led them to hate women. It is somewhat bothersome as all interests are traditionally, all my interests are traditionally male. Computers, video games, science, science fiction, and fantasy, and my female friends are not interested. How can I get over this? Um, okay. We're, and then they talk about the edits, but so, so, uh, Michaela, you're welcome to chime in if, if you want to, but otherwise I'm going to try to address this. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Yeah. So like, there are a couple things. So, so first of all, like I'm, I'm glad. And I, one of the things that I'm sure y'all can see is that this, this post got a lot of upvotes and, and I think that there have been a lot of like divisive reactions to this. Um, so some people can look at this and they can, they can see this as, it's okay to say I hate men, but it's not okay to say I hate women. And and we're going to get to that in a second. But so my first response to this is like, this is actually like what this community is for. Because this person is saying that I have a perception. I, there's a big difference between saying all men are evil and saying I perceive there's some part of me that perceives men is evil and i acknowledge that this is possibly irrational i even suspect that it's irrational and i'm trying to change it so this is a huge difference about what why our community is different from other corners of the internet because our goals here are not to say all women are bad or all men are bad or anything like that or good or bad or whatever. It's not to make generalizations about people. The purpose of this community is to be a place where if there is a part of yourself that you want to change, we're here to help you change it. That's what we're about. So there are a couple of other things about why this post I imagine didn't get taken down, right? And I actually don't make the rules on the subreddit. There are mods who are far wiser and more skilled at this than I am. And so these are their rules, which I'm, I'm on board with, by the way. So the first is that we don't make general statements of fact. We share our experiences. The second is what is the point of this, this post? This is not a, a post where someone is venting or even saying that all men are evil. This is a post of someone saying, hey, I've had a traumatic background. I do not think my way of thinking is right. I think actually I'm like the female version of an incel in some ways, and I want to stop thinking this way. I don't believe that this is actually true. There's some part of me that believes this is not true, but my mind has these kinds of thoughts. How do I change? So this is why this post stayed up. Now, the second thing is people may say, and this is where we have to be super careful. So when you read a post like this, you have to be careful about your own reaction. Because the first thing to understand is we are all biased by our perceptions, are all biased by our experiences. This is a post about when I see a man, even if they pretend to be nice, I do not believe they are nice. My mind is populating. My mind is populated with thoughts of this person is faking it. This person is going to be bad. This person is going to be evil. Every post you see on the internet, your mind is doing the same thing. Your mind is going to automatically populate with thoughts. And I imagine that the people who had an issue with this post are populating with these kinds of thoughts. This is unfair. This is biased against men. Oh, I can't make a similar post against women. You automatically have this reaction. But this is why this post is up. It's not that it's men or women or anything like that. It's that this person is saying, my mind has this pattern. I'm talking about my experience and I would like to change. That's why it stays up. Now you can say, you can make a post about, I dislike cats and I want to learn to love cats. And it, the same applies. The, the question is, what is your, what is the purpose of the post? What is this person trying to do? And the challenge is that when we read something like this, this can trigger all kinds of responses within us. And then we can get to censorship and bias and all this kind of stuff. But that's something that you're bringing to the table, right? You already preconceive of those ideas when you read this post. This is your emotional reaction to it. I'm not saying that there isn't something correct in what you're saying. I'm just pointing out that anytime we read something that is triggering, the most important thing to do is to take a step back and notice our own perception. What am I adding? How am I inferring? What, are, what am I extrapolating from a post like this? And if you do this, you will be able to utilize the internet in a far better way. 
Because the whole problem is that anytime we have a cognitive bias, and we're more likely to have a cognitive bias when we're emotionally active and we've been traumatized. This is not a bug, this is a feature. So as I get traumatized by something, my mind become learns that I can't take a risk. Right? So if like if I get bit by a snake, every rope that I see, my mind's initial reaction will be, is that a snake? That could be a snake. Let's treat it like a snake until it is proved otherwise. And so as we navigate through the internet, I see this all the time. And if y'all have seen like these kinds of posts about like, I'm going to use like sort of a, a silly example, but you know, I'll see these posts about, oh, this hero is OP or this champion is OP or this character is OP in a video game. And this person sort of makes this post and they're like, this person is completely ridiculous. And then people will comment, right? They'll say like, it's actually not that bad. You just have to know how to counter it, whatever. And then the person argues with them, argues with them, argues with them. The cherry on top of the person will say, how do I beat this character? Right? They'll ask this question. But anytime someone gives them an answer, they'll shoot it down. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. I don't know if y'all have seen these posts. But they're like, you know, every one of the OPs, everyone who answers the original poster gets upvoted and the OPs comments all get downvoted because the person is not actually there to learn. So we have to be careful because when we use the Internet, a lot of what we see comes from our perception. It comes from the way that we fill in the gaps. So this is something where, like, I don't think that this post is bad. Right. And I, I think that like there are parts of it that can be hurtful to other people. But I think this person's heart is in the right place. They're here to try to change their view. Right. And like for all the dudes out there who are like, oh, shit, women judge me so harshly. They don't give me a chance. Yeah. Th this is the one woman out there who is trying to change that. Right. This is this is an ally to all of the men who feel prematurely judged by women. Because here is a woman, I'm presuming it's a woman. We actually don't, I think, yeah, she says she's a woman. There's a woman who's saying, hey, I have a bias. How do I go about changing it? And we will want to fucking downvote her? Like, this is, the, this is what everyone's complaining about, right? Here is a woman who says, I believe this particular thing. I want to change. And on the flip side, everyone's complaining about, oh, like, people don't give me a chance, right? This is, this is person is trying. So there are a couple of other things that I encourage y'all to do. The first is that anytime you read something on our subreddit, you, the stronger your initial reaction, the more you need to slow it down, right? So like there are probably, I post on our subreddit rarely, but I would say that 80 to 90% of what I write on the subreddit, I do not actually post. So I go through this thing where I have an emotional reaction. I start typing, I pause, and then I just delete it. I delete the comment. And I'm like, this is not, I'm not in the right headspace. So there's 80 to 90% ghost comments that Dr. K almost posted, which I, I don't. Okay. So y'all should slow it down a little bit. The second thing to consider is that we want to try to approach people in this subreddit with as much compassion as we can muster. So try to understand that this person has been through a, a situation where like, holy shit, right? They've been like traumatized through and through and through. Like, stepdad problems, sounds like their step-siblings were not good. Sexual abuse, rape, being groped by family members, no less. Right? And if we, like, I mean, this is not rocket science here. I'm, I'm sure Dr. Thorderson will agree with what I'm about to say. But this is what happens, right? So when we look at the, the healthy development of a relationship with a gender, it doesn't matter whether it's same gender, opposite gender, whether you're gay, straight, I don't care. When there are people in your life that you are supposed to be able to trust and you cannot trust them, this is what's going to happen. So if I'm a boy or girl, doesn't matter whether I, if all the men in my life, the people who I'm supposed to trust, my dad, my stepdad, my siblings, my grandfather, my boss, my boyfriends, my friends, when all of these people have let me down, betrayed me, taken advantage of me in some way, it's going to be very hard to try to trust these people, right? This, this is going to happen to anyone in this situation. Um, and so try to temper the, like, as much compassion as you can muster is what you should muster. Secondly, like notice your own perception. What triggers you about this? Where does that hurt come from? Because as long as you are operating from a place of hurt, it's very difficult to leverage some degree of compassion. 
right? So like when y'all respond to this in a negative way, instead of vomiting on the internet, right? Which is normally what happens. And y'all know what I'm talking about where someone posts something and some, some asshole out there just starts vomiting negativity, vomit, negativity, vomit, negativity, vomit, negativity. That doesn't make the, it a productive place. So I, I'm not saying that you don't deserve to vomit on some level because you've been traumatized too. So the reason that we're even bringing this up is because we should have compassion for the people who approach this with toxicity, right? We should have compassion for everybody. That's why we're trying to do this. So we're trying to help everyone here by, first of all, t take a step back, take a deep breath, understand what your reaction is. Why is my reaction to this so strong? And what you're going to say is like, there are going to be people because I, I know part of the reason I know is because I used to be one. So I still have the thoughts that there's a double standard. You can make a post about I hate almost all men, but you cannot make a post about I hate almost all women. And even if that is true to some degree, which I think that that is to a certain degree true, so there's some evidence of that, that is irrelevant because that's not what we're about here. If you want to go fight a, a war to make the internet an equal place in terms of hatred, like go fight it somewhere else. We're a place where we want to help individuals grow. It's not about the rightness or the wrongness of it. It's about like, what are we here to do? And so as best as you can, notice your own reaction and the source of your own hurt. This will help you way more than vomiting whatever negativity you have out there. And we're not saying that you're to be blamed for the negativity because that's there for a reason too. You believe that way because you were traumatized. And so temper a little bit, try to get a little bit of compassion. And then imagine when you go on your rent, right, on the internet, how would you like people to respond to you? You want people to delete your post? No, of course not, right? You want you want people to be like responsive and caring and listen to what you have to say. So you should be try to be that for someone else, even if they find you, even if you're triggered by it. And if you're triggered by it and you can't respond, then just stay quiet, right? It's okay. You don't have to respond. Now, there's like another layer to this, which we're not going to get into, which is, you know, what should this person actually do? Like my TLDR is like they already kind of figured it out. I've, I've gone to therapy to resolve my depression, but didn't bother to tackle this worldview. Well, that's next, right? So in, in cases of, of overwhelming trauma, traumatic upbringing, I think therapy is the right answer. There are other layers to this to kind of understand, which if you guys want, we can explore this from a more theoretical standpoint, even like a yogic standpoint, what happens to the mind? How does this kind of construction happen? How can we understand this? There's also some like kind of very practical advice so like sometimes what I'll do with my patients when they're in situations like this is that I'll, I'll point out to them that, you know, they're, they're are safe. This kind of leans into what, what uh, Michaela was talking about, about like there are ways to approach relationships in a safer way. So a simple example of this is that if you have friends who are women that you trust, like trust completely or trust to a high degree, who have male friends or husbands or boyfriends or whatever, you can have some limited interaction with them in a safe environment while your female friend is there. Now, this too, you have to be a little bit careful because just because you're fe you trust your female friend and they trust their husband doesn't mean that the husband won't try to get laid with you. It's absolutely possible, right? And there's some people, some predators who even function that way. So you have to be a little bit careful, but generally speaking, this is the kind of thing where, you know, very practically when we're talking about like exposure therapy, like there are ways to expose yourself without putting yourself in danger. So that y'all can go, you know, it, this is just what patients have found helpful in the past, which is they'll sort of tell me what ended up working is I started to hang out with my friend and they had their brother there and their brother was like a nice guy and was trustworthy. And I was always with my friend. So I felt safe. So there are practical ways to do this, but that's something that y'all have to sort of sort out. Anyway, we wanted to just kind of talk about this. Like, I, I think that this is, you know, it's challenging for us to be, oh, whoops. It's challenging to be in this community for, I mean, this, because this is what happens, right? We have a place where we let people who have been traumatized come and share their story because they want to grow. And that's what we want to be here for. Um, and I, I don't, I don't blame the people who get upset by this. I don't blame y'all for seeing this as potentially biased or whatever, but really pay attention to this, right? Like, um, Right. So like the second sentence is this post is about my feelings, which I do not believe are fact. So the other big difference between this post and so many of the other posts is you'll have a lot of posts. Women are bitches. Men are all assholes. Men are untrustworthy. Right. Women are untrustworthy. These are statements of fact. There are people out there on the Internet who believe all this is fact. Your 
traumatized perception is a substitute for fact. And then what happens is because of the way that the internet, since these people say things like this and they get banned from all of the neutral places on the internet, the only place they are allowed to go is the places that everyone else has been banned. And so now we have fucking 4chan, right? This is how we get 4chan. And so this is why it's a toxic cesspool. Because we take all the banned people and where else do they go? They only have one place to go with each other. And then this kind of stuff intensifies. And then we are the one sad place on the internet where all of these people are coming back to. And I'm happy about that because I think that that's what we need. We need to like give these people a place to return to on the internet without ostracizing them. And at the same time, just because you are from one of those places does not mean that you get to engage in those toxic behaviors while you're here. Because this is a shared space. And so this is like very important to understand. Okay, last thing and then rant is going to end and then Dr. Thorderson can weigh in if she wants to. So this is very important to understand well, actually, about. Yeah. Dr. K, I, I do have to step off. Okay, really quickly. cool. So thank you so much. That was brilliant. I am so happy I got to um, <laughs> hear that explanation and review. Um, yes. <laughs> okay. Take care. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Have a great day. Okay. Bye. So this is the last thing that I'm going to say. We're going to talk a little bit about, and then we're, we're done for the day. Okay. Let me get out of Zoom. And meeting for all. Fucking done with that Zoom meeting. Okay, last thing to understand. So a lot of people are confused about, like, isn't this a place to vent? No, it's not a place to vent. It's a place to grow. So let's understand when it's okay to vent and when it's not okay to vent. See, venting is like passing gas. Like, sometimes you got to do it to relieve the tension. But just like farting, venting makes things a little bit worse for everyone around you. So if I walk into a room and I start venting about how my life is hard, do I need that release? Absolutely. But what effect does it have on the people around you? It's not positive, right? It, they have to absorb that negative emotional energy. So then what happens is we have these safe spaces on the internet where people come and they vent. Have y'all been to those safe spaces? We've had tons of posts on our subreddit of, I can't hang out here anymore. This place is way too toxic and negative for my mental because everyone is coming here and just venting their stuff. So this is like, and it's like good to vent, right? But then like, you'll even see this sometimes where like, uh, you know, people will like vent and then everyone else starts venting and then suddenly you're in a room where everyone is farting. And then it smells like shit. So it's not that you shouldn't vent. So even when, as a therapist, if my patients want to vent, that's good. But remember that the purpose of venting is to clear your emotional energy so that you can take action. See, a lot of people, like, I, I you know, we had a guest, she'll re remain unnamed, Who's kind of like, you know, don't, don't psychiatrists or therapists, don't they just want to like basically like addict you? Where you come in, you talk to them about their problems. And if they never help you, you come in every week, you talk about your problems, talk about your problems, talk about your problems. And then you're kind of hooked and then you never make any progress. That's not the point. I mean, sometimes it is, but not usually, right? So there's some people who are in a space where they cannot make effective change in their life. They're so, they have so little power or agency in their life that the only thing that they have left is that they need someone else to help them stay afloat. So sometimes therapy is for that. But the whole point of venting is that you clear your emotional energy, then your mind is thinking clearly. And once your mind is thinking clearly, you take action to actually fix the problem. So venting is the first step. It is cleaning the kitchen before you cook. Now, this is the problem is that this has been lost for like 95% of the internet. And you have pe places where people just go to vent, 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 vent. Right? Without ever taking action. Without ever actually doing something about the problem. And so sometimes people will come and they'll, they'll be surprised because they're like, isn't this a safe space? And like, yeah, we want people to feel safe here, but I don't know what the term safe space means. Because oftentimes it seems like when, when like the way people interpret it is like safe space means I get to say whatever the fuck I want to. I can take a, I can walk into the room. I can take a dump on the ground and then no one is going to like get upset. And if anyone tells me that I'm doing something that's out of line, it's no longer a safe space, safe space, you're restricting my speech, whatever. 
Now, on the flip side, there are reasons to create safe spaces. Right? So we have some areas of the internet where, like, unless we keep some people out, they will come inside and start dumping on the ground. And we don't want to do that. So we want y'all to feel safe, but the goal here is not safety. The goal here is growth. And in that event, of course, we want to keep it safe, right? We don't want, like, predators and shit like that. So I'm not saying that safety is bad. But what I'm saying is that some somehow, I don't know what safe space has started to mean to some people. Right? It's like, this means that no one is allowed to criticize me when I open my mouth. Like, that's not what this is. I mean, people criticize me. And it's my subreddit. Right? And it's like, that's a good thing. People are like, I don't like how Dr. K does it. Like, that's good. Like, we're all on this journey together. It's not really my subreddit. It's our subreddit. We're on this journey together. I'm arguably a little bit further along, but I'm not even sure of that. Right? That's the presumption because I'm the guy who's in front of the camera. But if y'all pay attention to this community, the wisdom in this community comes from the community. It doesn't come from me. We have people like Dr. Thorderson today. We have all of the people who have come on, people like Thor and people like rando randos from our community who have come on and shared their experience. And we've learned from all of them. And so, look, in summation, you know, I can totally understand how someone would read a post like this and get very upset. But I ask for your patience and your compassion. And it's not even that we're right, right? So this is the other thing. If you listen to this, you calm down, and with a clear head, you say, I think this is wrong. Totally fine. Make your case. We're here to listen. But if you jump to some kind of conclusion, and all of the toxicity from the other parts of your life find a projection on this kind of thing, then that's not okay. That's not what we're here for. Right? And this is the kind of thing where, like, I'm sure someone out there is like, I'm going to make a post that has all these things, but I'm going to reverse men with women. And let's see what happens. I guarantee you there's someone out there thinking that. You know why? Because I thought that. Because I used to be that way. And then I ask you, fine, you can do that. You can have your experiment. You can even win. But then what's the point? What are you trying to prove? That's not what we're here for. We're not here to prove someone right or prove someone wrong. How does that help you grow? It's beyond the scope of what we're trying to do. So these mods are working so hard to create a set of rules that allow us to grow as human beings. And who is us? It's the fucking internet. Have y'all been to the internet? Have y'all seen what a cesspool it is? And now we have these mods that are trying to create a space for civil discussion and growth. With this fucking hand of cards... And so, so one of y'all out there is going to think like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach them that their rules are bad. And you're going to win. Because out of all the conniving motherfuckers, you're going to win. Because someone out there will be able to puncture a system of rules that our mods can develop. Because they're human. And they're not perfect. And no set of rules is perfect. There's always some way to like disarm some set of rules, find some way to twist things around and get to what you want. Which is why I ask you, what are you here for? Are you here to fight a crusade against injustice? Please, I am grateful that you're fighting a crusade against injustice. Go do it somewhere else. Let us focus on growth. All right. Thus endeth the rant. Now, if y'all want to, I I'm tempted to do, maybe we'll kind of revisit this because I think like walking through this process is really good. What this person is sort of saying is like, how do I change my beliefs if I have a toxic set of beliefs? Um, <laughs> and so, I, I don't know, we'll see. So we're gonna, we're, we'll see y'all on Monday. Uh, we have our super secret project should be coming out in a couple months. I don't know when we're done filming a huge shout out to Dr. Thorderson for showing up today, um, sharing a lot about her perspective on women's mental health. Um, I found it very educational. I was able to, as, if you guys stuck around, you, you noticed like I was able to put together certain dots and, and that's, that's kind of like, you know, 
So I, I think I do a pretty good job in some ways when it comes to supporting women's mental health. Um, obviously, as a clinician, my patients seem to like it. And at the same time, I think that like without the lived experience of being a woman, I, I just can't connect some of the dots. And so that's why I'm eternally grateful for people like Dr. Thorderson and, and the women in our community for sharing their perspective. And, and, you know, I can look at research. Dr. Thorderson can look at research. Like there's, it's not that I'm incompetent at this. It's that I cannot, I can offer something from the male perspective because I have one big bucket of experience with growing up as a man. The other thing that I would encourage y'all to do is uh, there were many statements made today. Hopefully th y'all didn't get this vibe, but it's not like Th Dr. Thorderson isn't saying that this there's a similar thing that happens to men. We just condition them differently. So the issues that we kind of talked about were focused on women because that's totally fine to do that. Sometimes we talk about men, right? And the experiences of different kinds of people are different. And we have to be able to talk about people's experiences in isolation. Sometimes it's useful to sort of... Uh, note that things are more widely applicable. So I'm not saying that, you know, it has to be 100% equal on both sides or 50-50 or whatever, or that we can't mention men if we're talking about women, or we can't mention women if we're talking about men. But hopefully this was helpful to y'all for the women in our community. Hopefully you found this educational and useful for the men in our community. Hopefully you found this educational and useful. I think a lot of these concepts like cognitive load and stuff like that are things that we're not really aware of, um, especially as dudes. And on the flip side, there are going to be other kinds of hidden, there's other kinds of hidden work that men experience that women don't sort of think about, right? So a good example of this, just one example is when there's a violent patient on, an, on, a, on a psychiatric unit, the men step forward. No one asks you to. It's just one dude walks up to another dude and they say there's someone who's violent. They would always page me. They wouldn't page my female colleagues, right? And that's just sort of the expectation. So there's hidden work all over the place for all kinds of people. And I think that we're going to get better the more we understand this as a whole. Like, it's not about it fairness or unfairness or anything like that. I'm not a ju judge. It's not, I'm not God. I can't determine what's fair or just. Our goal here is to understand the experience of other people, understand our own experience, and then do whatever we can to help it. It's about moving it forward, not whether it's 50-50. I, I don't know about that. Right? There's all kinds of hidden work all over the place. And... People don't get thanked for it. All right. Y'all take care. Have a good weekend. Thank you so much for coming here. And honestly, a huge shout out to everyone in this community. Whether you're good, you're bad, you got banned, you didn't get banned, whatever. Whether you have a lot of upvotes, no upvotes. Like, look, everyone is here. You're all a part of the process. And I'm grateful to each and every one of you. Because that's what, like, even the people who are toxic, we can learn from, right? And I say this as someone who was toxic, arguably still toxic from time to time, depending on, on how poorly my carry farms.